or oftentimes is longer than the uh, seminar itself. So okay. it could be one half and even two hours. Okay. So Sudin, we have more panelists joining us. Do you uh, want to uh, let help me, introduce? Let me, uh, yeah, let me uh, very briefly introduce uh, this uh, panelist. Uh, Jin Yan is a uh, pro assistant professor in, um, uh, from Yale University. We are working together on biofilms. Uh, Hi, everyone. Yeah. Chang Jinghua is my former PhD student, now an assistant professor from uh, NTU, Nanyang Technological University. Hello, uh, everyone. Lauren Zada is uh, my colleague here in chemistry. Uh, Lauren is really a rising star. I, I think uh, Lauren got, uh, got her uh, PhD from Harvard, right? Yeah, you should be my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, Lauren and I are trying to work together on the coupling of uh, uh, chemical mechanical uh, taxes. Um, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Yao is my uh, former graduate student. Right now, is a postdoc uh, uh, with uh, Daniel Cosgrove on mechanical biology of plant cell wall. So uh, yeah. Yao. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Nice. So Yao is really doing a fantastic job. He's a uh, looking for a job uh, while he has a job secure somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Prashant, ask, uh, answer your question. So as Tern said, um, this uh, panelist thing is very informal. Okay. Just imagine yourself uh, wander into the room, talk to people, and if you're busy for some reason, you have to leave, you just leave. You don't need Excellent. to uh, apologize. Uh, and also anybody can be a panelist in, in principle. You just raise your blue hand. We're all colleagues. Okay. Yeah. So and here, here come panelists. two more panelists here. Oh, three more. Uh, Pradeep is here. Yeah. Hong Yan yeah. is here. Kai, good morning, uh, Pradeep. Hey, hello, everyone. Hey. So hey, Pradeep. Pradeep, Pradeep doesn't need any introduction, right? <laughs> Hong Yan um, was a former, my former pri uh, PhD student, now is a, a, a professor in the uh, yeah. Southern University of Science and Technology. Actually, he used to be a, a professor in university for Rhode, Rhode Island. He just uh, recently moved back to China. Uh, Kai Yang is uh, my collaborator in Suzhou University in Physics. Hi, Kai. Good morning. Good, yes. afternoon. Good, good evening. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> yeah, Celine. Yeah, hi, nice hi, to hi. meet. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hey, Pradeep, this background look very scholarly. Is that a real background? <laughs> so what is your no. <laughs> Yes. I, I I used to have a, a, a background of a beach, uh, oh. and then I think uh, I, I realized after some time that the meetings were not being taken that seriously. So I <laughs> I put this one on. Okay. Uh, this is actually interesting. Uh, so I uh, I recall I had this uh, conversation with Jigong mm. many years ago, and um, Jigong has always been inspiring. And I remember uh, we were talking about the uh, the candles, right? So in old days, if you think about it, the candle was invented, it's for lighting purpose. Yeah. And now we still use candle. We use candle for mood not just for a lighting purpose anymore, right? So if you go to a restaurant and you light a candle for it to give you some <laughs> mood to, for the old days or some romantic uh, uh, atmosphere up there. Now, uh, I, I, I think the topic was uh, about the books, about uh, printing versus reading from the uh, computer and uh, uh, iPad. Uh, laptop, right? I remember Pradeep, you were also asking what kind of reading medium uh, everyone is using, right? So um, I remember also uh, uh, I either me or someone made a comment that, okay, if you look at the books, uh, we print books, read books a lot in old days. More and more we start to put the books on the bookshelf for decoration or for mood. <laughs> for, now, Pradeep, your background is showing another evidence that we need a book, a bookshelf with books as a background <laughs> for Zoom <laughs> in the era I, of Zoom. I think it kind of goes well, yeah, well with our jobs. Actually, I, had, I think, I don't know who it was. I think uh, I know somebody who had a background of a prison cell. 
So when you look at his picture, you look like it will appear that he is in a prison cell with, uh, with a bar. <laughs> <laughs> quite, uh, yeah, uh, quite uh, appropriate, I guess, for this time. Yeah. But hopefully, yeah. uh, uh, maybe Sulin will tell us a little bit more about uh, how to get out of this jail. Are you going to talk? About, are you going to talk wow. about corona, coronavirus, Sulin? What? Are you going to talk about how you're going to stress the coronavirus? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm going to touch a little bit on that. I, I'm actually trying to work on that. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah. Trying to understand why this uh, coronavirus is so contagious, right? So uh, coronavirus is a natural design nanoparticles, and uh, uh, Changjin and I uh, are actually working on uh, designing synthetic nanoparticles to effectively targeting cancer cells. Right? That's one of our projects. Uh, but no matter how hard you work on that, you can never be the nature made. Uh, uh, you can never be, be the nature. Nature made, uh, uh, nature made uh, materials are always outperform engineering materials. Right. In many aspects. So Lynn, uh, and, and it's then in the, the nature material is the first step. <laughs> well, yeah. they, they've had a mil millions of years of evolution. So, you know, I guess if we had that much time, we might be better too. Uh, <laughs> so in, before, yeah, go ahead, Prashant. Sorry. Uh, what is written behind, uh, in the background behind you? There are Chinese characters there. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, 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 Jigan actually asked that. You probably cannot recognize it. Let me uh, uh, mirror it. If you unmirror it, this is the my car uh, calligraphy, OK? <laughs> so that's my hobby. Used to be my hobby when I was young. But uh, when I'm trying to find time doing that, it's really an art, you know? I, I, I like that. Um, but nowadays, I, I don't have time doing that, right? OK, but you still didn't say what is written. Yeah, it's just a poem. Oh, right. Yeah, poem yeah. is very... Uh, for I'm Chinese, uh, you just look at shape. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The meaning doesn't yeah. matter. The let shape... Me, let me hide, hide myself. Yeah, so, yeah. So, like so Zigang, why cannot you read it? You know Chinese, right? Huh? <laughs> So these Chinese uh, only look look at a secret code to me. I don't need them. I, I just look at a shape. It's good enough. Uh, it's it's written by a po poet in Tang Dynasty. It's a uh, Tang Wang Ge Xu. Uh, okay. So, so everybody, uh, all the Chinese people knows uh, about that poem. Except the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, most people cannot. Most people cannot. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yes, the, uh, with us. Uh, huh? Huh? Morning, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. I recognize all uh, most of the words, uh, but uh, I cannot really, uh, you know, tell you the the meaning. Uh, this is uh, too old. Too old. This is not like old English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Jimmy. Uh, good evening. Okay, <laughs> try to make this correct <laughs> for you. Good. So. Yeah, I, actually, I, I I want to wait when Jimmy uh, join us, and uh, the, the before the webinar, uh, I'm supposed to, or we together, are supposed to have an informal interview with the speaker. So today is uh, Professor Su Lin Zhang. So I'll start with uh, a question, uh, uh, also related uh, to Jimmy as well. So you started uh, uh, as an undergraduate student in uh, Dalian University of Technology, right? We know that's uh, known for uh, uh, computational materials, uh, computational mechanics, I mean, uh, more specific, um, uh, in China, also in the world. And then after graduation, you join Wei Yan's group, uh, working uh, for your master degree on uh, micro cracks, fracture mechanics. Then you move to uh, University of Illinois of Urbana Champaign, working with uh, Jimmy. I recall you were working on also on some uh, interfacial fracture mechanics, plasticity, elasticity at that time. And then you moved to Northwestern as a postdoc with the late uh, Ted Belichko, of course. Um, computational mechanics with applications in carbon nanotubes, even graphene at that time. And now, today you're going to talk about the um, 
mechanobiology. I assume all this start to happen either at the very early stage when you start your uh, uh, independent uh, academic career as an assistant professor. How, how did you make such a transition and how did you get interested in this topic? And you have been uh, very focused on this topic for many, many years and not everyone can do that. Uh, so that's uh, uh, some question I'm very curious about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If I look back, I think uh, I'm very really lucky to have these three uh, visionary uh, advisors to work with. Uh, I remember that back in 1997, uh, at the time that I lived in Tsinghua University, uh, Wei told me that, hey, uh, uh, Su Lin, you should be working on uh, course disciplinary problems. I still remember that word very vividly, okay? And then, uh, so I learned a lot from, from Wei on solid mechanics, fraction mechanics, of course, right? Uh, in Illinois, uh, Jimmy is more on the material side than, <laughs> than on the mechanical side, I guess, right? So I learned a lot from, uh, from Jimmy on, on materials, looking at the microstructures of, of the materials. And then, of course, uh, Ted Blaschko, his uh, uh, computational person, I learned a lot from, from him. So my background is really a mixture. And it's very funny that uh, when I left, uh, uh, at the, at the kick, kick, kick of lunch with uh, Ted, Ted told me that, hey, Su Lin, you need to work on something else that different from what I'm doing because it's, it's, it's not soon for you to beat me that hard. You know, or maybe you can never beat me. Look at my students. Of course, Ted is the giant, right? In in computer computer mechanics. So um, so that's lead to the uh, 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 biology. So I think uh, uh, when I talk with the Ted, Ted that told me that he once worked on biology a little bit on bone fracture, right? But he never continued because he uh, was annoyed by this uh, long terminology in biology. <laughs> So I say, okay, this is definitely something different from what he's doing, <laughs> I guess, right? So uh, it's always a struggling uh, uh, a process when, uh, as you start your career as assistant professor, uh, same as me. So I, I, I read a lot of literature and I'm trying to uh, make a synergy of what, what I can do and what is on the market, what is interesting in me, right? Uh, yeah, that's lead to this uh, uh, mechanical biology thing. Maybe I can add to that, Tang. Uh, I think uh, uh, Su Lin's uh, perhaps one of the first encounters to mechanobiology was this uh, 2009 Gem 4 summer school. Both of you attended that. Yes. And uh, we invited quite a few interesting biologists, including uh, Mike Sheets, to give. Uh, a lecture over there. The GEM4 Summer School, GEM4 stands for Global Enterprise for Micro Mechanics and Molecular Medicine. So Micro Mechanics Molecular Medicine, it's M to the fourth power. And uh, that was an organization started by Subra Suresh uh, back in 2005, I believe, at MIT. So. Uh, because of that organization, we organized a series of GEM4 Summer Institute. Uh, the first one was at Caltech, 2008. The second one was at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I see uh, Tahir Saif here. So he, he's one of the organizers of the GEM4 Summer Schools. Uh, and I, I think both of you attended this. And uh, uh, if I remember correctly, you were, both of you were, were very interested in this new area of mechanobiology. And it turned out that uh, uh, Mike Sheath eventually came to Singapore and became the director of Mechanobiology Institute or BMI uh, or MBI. 
Volcano Biology Institute, which is one of the uh, centers of excellence uh, in Singapore. There are five of them. Each one of them is on the order of $150 million for 10 years. So it's a large scale uh, research center. And uh, he retired or he, he left that center uh, last year. But that center is known to be sort of the beacon of mechanobiology mm -hmm. in the field. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, uh, this uh, uh, June 4 is really a uh, very inspiring uh, event. And that's, of course, uh, 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 motivated me, inspired me doing this uh, mechanobiology thing. I think we should uh, uh, um, introduce more uh, panelists here. Yeah, go ahead, Sulin. I know some of them, but probably not all of them. Maybe uh, I think uh, I'll let you to introduce uh, those who join us uh, after yeah. we start the interview. So Yalin Liu is a professor from Lehigh University. Yalin. Hi. So I, I've been knowing like uh, Sulin for a very long time since we both at Los Festen. So yeah. I think uh, at that time, Sully is not doing anything about this mechanical biology yet, but we have a lot of interesting discussions. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that inspire him later to explore this whole field. Yeah, Yali is doing great in the high university. And Bing Liu from Tsinghua University. Hi, Bing. <laughs> and uh, uh, Xu from uh, Dali, uh, Dali University of Science and Technology. So my... Uh, <laughs> My, uh, uh, yeah, from the same school, and I, I, I graduated from uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, study. And Tahaya, I don't think we need to, uh, uh, we don't need any uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, Yen Fei, uh, yeah, from Tennessee. Tim from Secrets, right? Yeah. Syracuse, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Yin uh, from Yukon. Hi, everyone. All these people are, so, uh, are more or less working on the uh, area uh, related to to the uh, to mechanical biology or have interest. Suling, you missed our great friend Ting Zhu. <laughs> oh, Ting Zhu, uh, Ting. Well, I don't think Ting need any introduction. Everyone knows him. <laughs> Hi, Suling. Morning. Yeah. Good morning, Hello, everyone. Sorry, yeah. Good morning. There, yeah, so, here comes another uh, 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 wonderful panelist, uh, Yumi from USTC. So hi, nice to meet you all. Yeah, so Yong is uh, my hometown is actually in Anhui. So whenever I go back to uh, China visit my family, Yong is there. So we're really uh, close, both in uh, you know. Uh, also, we're working together on face field. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is great. This great panel. Uh, Yulin, Thank I, you, uh, Sulin, for uh, inviting us. Uh, Tahir, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, just one comment. What, so what uh, Jimmy was saying, and I, I think he's always very modest, so he didn't say what he did after the Gem 4. Uh, I think I, we, should, we, should, uh, we should not forget that, you know, after the Gem 4, where the driving force, actually, was Jimmy Shah. Uh, and soon as the gem 4 was going on the, the meetings every you know, summer workshops uh, jimmy put together a group um, and we jimmy wrote the uh, an institute proposal to nsf uh, and that supported the following five years of summer workshops uh, jimmy correct me if i'm wrong if i'm not recalling the history uh, in fact that in total of 10 years uh, so when GEM4 was there, GEM4 was mostly supported by the institutions, like when it was at Caltech, Caltech paid a lot of money. When it was in Illinois, the students contributed and then Illinois contributed. But then uh, when the institute was granted from NSF, NSF was paying all the costs, which made it significantly broadened to people who couldn't pay. And it opened up to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and we would have people from all over the world. They just paid their airfare and we and the Institute covered all their expenses. Uh, so that was instrumental. I think that 10 years, five of 
gem four and five from the Jimmy's Institute. So it, it produced a batch of people. And uh, Jimmy, when I sometimes I see many of those students have become now look older and they, <laughs> they still remember, oh, you know, uh, you know, I went to this uh, summer workshop, you know, uh, 2010 or even before, and they are now almost senior professors. Uh, so I think uh, sometimes we tend to forget who contributes how much, and we look at the science as we should. But at the same time, we should reflect on who laid the foundations uh, for the generations to come. So I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we all uh, think about it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Nahia. You're very kind. That, that there are also other panelists. I, I see Pradeep, Pradeep Sharma over there from Houston. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, Hi, you. Yeah. And uh, maybe, uh, Suli, you should introduce. Yeah, I, I introduce uh, quite, a, uh, quite a lot. I just, I just want to introduce the new uh, newcoming. Uh, so Zhe Chen from Dartmouth, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hui Yang, Thanks, uh, yeah. Uh, Hui Yang uh, was uh, one of my former PhD students. Right now, is in uh, a professor in uh, uh, Huarong uh, University of Science Technology. Julian, there are a few more. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just waiting for Hui to say hello to everybody. Oh, oh hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Hui Yang from Huarong University of Science and Technology. Yeah. And Wen Pong and Zhu uh, is from Zhongshan University. Uh, uh, Jin Du is my colleague in uh, uh, um, Penn State, mechanical engineering. Hey, hello, everybody. And Julie is my long-term collaborator from MIT. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi. Lots of friends here. Uh, and Ke Jie is uh, 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 one of the former uh, students uh, from uh, uh, Jigang's group and a postdoc from Julie group. Uh, now is a professor in uh, Purdue University. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. And Shao Xin is there. I, I didn't see his face. And from Zhejiang University. And Wenbin Li from uh, West Lek University in China. And I, I, I think uh, Wenbin is. Hey, uh, Wenbin. Good morning. You're muted. Yeah. And Projel is my, uh, my current student working in this area. Hi, Hi, Sulin and everyone. <laughs> I'm in the hotel room, so I using the uh, using a back picture, background picture. <laughs> okay, that's that's good. Um, I think that Christian uh, Frank is here. Hey, Chris. Hi, Sulin. How are you? Good. How are you? It seems like a great <laughs> group of people. <laughs> yeah, Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone on the panel to be here. What a panel, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is great. This makes uh, my job much easier. So uh, we had a, a informal interview uh, with Sulin on uh, his transition of research topics from very diverse uh, uh, research background to one of the his uh, focus uh, nowadays the mechanical biology so uh, we can continue the uh, this informal interview or the discussions along this line after the uh, webinar uh, and we can also uh, ask all kinds of questions um, during the uh, Q&A session so at this time um, I think uh, we have uh, uh, more people are joining us also in the um, uh, attendee as well as the panelists. I'm, I want to make a very brief <laughs> uh, a note that uh, given that the, uh, the, uh, we are not anymore in the, uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, daylight saving time, so we make an adjustment of the starting time recently for EML webinar, it seems that uh, it has caused a little confusion for people um, to join us. So I want to briefly remind everyone that the new starting time of EML webinar uh, 
ideas. Um, in the U.S. Eastern Time, it's 9:30 a.m. on Wednesdays. For the Pacific Time, it's 6:30 a.m. on Wednesdays. Uh, in Asia, it's 10:30 p.m. on Wednesdays. In Europe, it's 2:30. P.M. in London and 3:30 P.M. in Paris. So um, hopefully this uh, help you to mark your calendar correctly. So um, we keep this great seminar series continue. So Sulin, can I ask you to start to share your slide and then okay. I'll start to introduce. Okay, it is my great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce today's EML webinar uh, speaker, Professor Su Lin Zhang. Um, Professor Zhang received his bachelor degree uh, from Dalian University of Technology in 1994, a master of science degree from Tsinghua University in 1997 under Wei Yan, and a PhD degree from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign in 2002 under uh, Jimmy Xia, uh, all from engineering mechanics. He then worked as a postdoc uh, fellow in Northwestern University under Ted Belichko. And he started as a assistant professor in the University of uh, Arkansas uh, from 2005 to 2007, and is currently a professor in the Department of Engineering Science and Mechanics, and also Department of Biomedical Engineering at Penn State University. His research interest is really uh, diverse and lies in the roles of mechanical forces and the stresses in materials, chemistry, and biology. Uh, he's a recipient of the Early Career Development Award from NSF in 2007 and the PSEAS Outstanding Research Award in 2016 from Penn State University. Uh, Sulin is one of our uh, founding uh, editor of uh, Extreme Mechanics Letters and also serves on the editorial board uh, for MPJ Computational Materials. And we all know that the 2020 started with an unexpected uh, start and uh, already put quite some stress for every one of us. Uh, maybe the best way to deal with this stress is to understand the stress. Uh, so, uh, Sulin today is going to tell us a tale of the stress life of living organisms. Uh, without further ado, uh, Sulin, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Ten, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, Ten and I started collaboration more than 20 years ago. We published the first paper in 1997. Right? It's still a great memory to me. Uh, thanks to Jigang uh, for putting me in this spot. <laughs> I'm honored. Uh, thanks for all friends for joining us uh, from all over the world. Uh, Jimmy uh, was my PhD advisor sitting here. If I say anything wrong today, uh, it's all Jimmy's fault. <laughs> so before I get started, uh, I want to introduce my students and collaborators who have been working uh, with me uh, on these problems. Hong Yan was, was my first PhD student work, working in this area. He's now a uh, uh, professor in uh, Southern University of Science and Technology. I used to be a professor in the uh, University of uh, uh, Rhode Island. Chang Jing Huang actually uh, start, uh, started my math lab in Penn State from scratch. He's now assistant professor uh, in uh, Nanyang Technological University. Hui Yang is not working in this area, but uh, he has been working on electrochemistry coupled with mechanics. He's in host, but <coughs> kind of uh, idea he produced in uh, electrochemistry can be borrowed to study the uh, biochemistry. Yao Zhang is currently, currently a postdoc uh, in uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Cosgrove's group working on mechanical biology of pollen cells. He's landing a job somewhere in China or US pretty soon. Chun Wei is now in uh, Boston and Tian Ka and uh, Xue Shen uh, will be postdoc in somewhere. And I have two new students, Praja and Lu Yi working in this area. So I have uh, quite a few uh, collaborators in this area. Uh, 
what I'm going to mention is the names that I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, in, uh, on fly in, in, my, in my talk. So Lauren Dada is my colleague in Penn State uh, from chemistry. Uh, we're trying to working on uh, chemotaxis and mechanotaxis coupled together. Sean Sun and Karen Reddy uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins, we're working on mechanoepigenetics. Xiaodeng Chen, Jimmy, and uh, Ping Chang, we're working on uh, small scale uh, gap closure uh, of cells. Jin Yan from Yale, we're working on biofilms, and Hobart Hui, we're working on uh, capillary actions. So, why mechanobiology? Uh, um, this is really, uh, this is a video that uh, used by many others and tests us a lot. Okay, let me, let me play this video. I, and you see that this neutrophil is chasing down the uh, bac uh, bacterium, right? Uh, you see that seals, this seals neutrophil is very soft, very flexible. How soft is that? It is the great uh, John Rogers, the great, greatest effort to match, right? And the cells are very active. You see that it's not just waiting for the bacterium to, to be bumped, bumped into him. The neutrophil actively sins and chase and swallow the uh, bacterium. So uh, the cell is very sensitive, responsive, adaptive. It undergoes constant revolving, self assembly, and self healing, etc. So uh, you can you can see that this is a miniaturized robot. We know that the soft robot is a hot area of research nowadays, and people are doing a fantastic job there. But if anyone can replicate what this little cell can do here, I'm pretty sure that many of us would want to retire immediately. So no doubt, cell and tissue outperforms uh, outperform engineering materials in many aspects. So that's not surprising many people. What surprised me is that cells do more than just a soft active robots. Uh, it is the way that lean matter store and process information. CPU of the, the, the best uh, computer in our days is about a gigahertz uh, range. That is, the chip can carry out a billion uh, operations per second, okay? Our brain consists of billions of neurons and can carry uh, 10, to, 10 to the power 15 operations per second. That is in the femtohertz range. So our brain, is one time uh, one million times faster than the uh, than the computer chips. Data storage of living material is also astonishingly uh, astonishingly effective. Nearly two thousand years ago, uh, papers were invented by this Chinese fellow Cai Lin, and another f about uh, about another thousand years later, Bi Xing, another Chinese fellow, invented the printing technique. They can print words on papers. Since then, human rely on the printed volume to store information and knowledge. You pick up a book, and it, it can be easily calculated that the information storage efficiency is about 10 kilobytes per second per centimeter cubed. The information technology in the last 50 years really make, made very impressive uh, progress. Now, a portable jump drive can easily reach a capacity of 100 gigabytes. Okay, so the storage uh, uh, efficiency is roughly one gigabytes, 100 gigabytes per centimeter cubed. This is the one million times faster or, or more efficient, one million times more efficient than printed volumes. Now let's look at how living cells store information, right? Each cell contains human genome about 6 billion base pairs. And that's equivalent to 1.5 gigabytes uh, uh, 1.5 gigabytes of information, all squeezed into a tiny nucleus of no more than 10 microns in diameter, okay? How insane is that? Harvard University uh, has a total of about 17 million volumes of books. If you can have the same st storage technology as cell nucleus, all the data from Harvard library can be stored in a cube of one millimeter in size. And this, this is insane, right? So uh, it takes home being uh, nearly a thousand years to evolve from the printed books to digital time in our, in our modern time, right? So 
So going from the current technology to the biotechnology, that is one million times more efficient. How many years we would expect we can reach that? One million, roughly about two to the power of 20, according to the Moore's law, right? It takes 40 time, 40 years uh, for us to reach capacity and efficiency as our human brains and cells. Uh, under the condition that Moore's law continues to work, okay? I think the best scenario, scenario, scenario I can tell is that by then most of us already retire from our current job. There's only one uh, good enough in Texas, right? So what mechanics can do? What, what me mechanicians can do about biology? We found that living systems are stressed. Our heart pumps, our heart pumps, blood flows, intestines, vagal, lungs, inhales, and exhales. We walk, we, we do exercise, etc. Right? All these activities will generate macroscopic forces. And studies have shown that these macroscopic forces have physiological consequences. Study this, the role of these uh, macroscopic forces in human body for in the realm of a, a classical or traditional biomechanics. And it is not uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Rather, I would be more interested in the forces gener generated at the cellular and multicellular level. Right? We all know that human body exercises a strict thermal regulation to keep a roughly constant temperature called the temperature homeostasis. I'll show you in this uh, video I just played, right? When they adhere in the cell migrating on substrate, it self generates tiny forces inside and which get it transmitted to outside. We now believe that cell maintains a certain level of stress to, for, to perform essential uh, cellular structures or uh, cellular functions. In other words, we believe that cell also implement strict stress regulation throughout its lifetime. And that's, that is stress homeostasis. When cell loses the stress level, cell die, okay? So it seems that we are doomed. We either accept to live a stress life or to die, to be stress-free. I really think that we don't really, we, we, we don't have much choice here. So stress uh, in cells and in our bodies, may you like it or not. So we need to deal with it. The challenge to, to, uh, to us is to understand the living cells, uh, is to understand living cells is very tremendous. First, inside the cell, collective molecular interactions on the energy scale of KBT are constantly taking place. On such a small energy scale, tiny forces matter. And these tiny forces really makes our stress lives uh, asymptomatic. <laughs> Uh, marrying these forces are uh, understanding their physiological con consequences or uh, uh, implications are uh, quite challenging. Second, uh, living, living cells constantly consume and dissipate energy, right? So uh, undergoing this thermodynamic irreversible process all the time. When this uh, uh, irreversible process ceases, uh, life ends. In fact, it is very common to observe that living systems destroy orders near the equilibrium and create orders out of equilibrium or far from equilibrium. Thus, we can no longer uh, use energy minimization to find results as we normally do for structural materials. So uh, mechanical and biochemical processes exist in parallel and interact in concert in, uh, in living systems. Understanding the crosstalk between mechanics and biochemistry uh, uh, poses a tremendous challenge uh, in both uh, for, to both biologists and the mechanicians and demand crosstalks between these two communities. So here is my outline. So um, I will start with artificial cells, vesicles, and then move on to the simplest cell, that's the red blood cell without nucleus, and then the adhe single adherent cells and multicellular structures. I then present some specific problems that I have been working on, including nanoparticle-based uh, targeting, Mechanomorphogenesis, that's uh, gap closure, mechano, uh, mar uh, uh, mechano marker, uh, in ultra metastasis, and the mechanical sensing. Okay. Uh, throughout these examples, I try to highlight the synergy between mechanics and biochemistry. So, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll try to keep you excited but not bored about this long laundry list. Uh, right? 
So uh, membrane exists everywhere inside and outside the cell and uh, displays fascinating shapes. Uh, the basic building block of cell membrane is a lipid molecule, right? With a hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic uh, tails. If you throw these molecules in water and it automatically uh, serve a symbol, serve a symbol to a uh, closed bag called a vesicle. So uh, this vesicle is, uh, is really a has re really has fascinating properties. It's a, it's a truly multi-scale material with the thickness of only five nanometer. Uh, in the latter dimension, it can span uh, hundred microns more. Um, it is a liquid crystal. It got orders in the plane. It highly flexible, highly robust. It can undergo large conformational and topological changes. We want to create a model to simulate the conformational and topological changes in the uh, liquid uh, bilayer or the vesicle. So there are many existing methods. Fully atomistic, uh, fully atomistic molecular dynamic simulations are computationally very expensive, right? So on the other end of the lens spectrum, we have continuing uh, method using the Herfage energy model, but continuing method is very difficult to deal with the fluidity. So uh, a balance between the computational efficiency and the physical accuracy is the coarse grain model. And people have developed uh, this is a chain of BS border we want to develop a one agent thick uh, uh, bead model, okay? And uh, to boost the computational efficiency. Right. So the challenge is to stabilize uh, the agents in 2D surface with the fluid phase in 3D space using the pairwise interaction potential. And uh, at the time that we're working on this problem, there was a science paper claimed that it would be not possible to do that at all. So uh, this really worked out quite uh, nicely uh, by, uh, 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 by Ju and my student Hong Yan. So we found that there are two key features to stabilize the 2D fluid uh, in 3D space using uh, pairwise potential. First, uh, the interactive potential should have a soft core such that the agent can easily swap their positions to enable into diffusion, right? As shown here, we can parameterize this, the, the, the interaction potential. We can change the slope near the uh, equilibrium condition so that to uh, change the, or, or to control the restoring force to enable diffusion. Another uh, uh, feature is to, is to enable the orientation dependent interaction, okay? Um, for this, we introduce additional or, uh, or, orientation degrees of freedom for the agents in addition to the translation degrees of freedom, okay? As shown below, the orientation dependent potential favors the parallel uh, configuration, but this favors the other configurations for a pair of uh, interacting agents. So with this orientation dependent potential, we can enable ordering, okay? So this worked out quite well, right? So for instance, we can uh, stabilize uh, the 2D fluid in 3D space here. You see the mixing, uh, mixing of the particles showing this is the liquid phase. Uh, we throw these particles in 3D space, it uh, automatically uh, self-assemble into the vesicles. And this is a benchmark test that you must pass for these models. I stop here. Yeah, we use this model to simulate uh, this uh, vesicle shape transformations of all kinds, right? So outward body, in, inward body, in, tubulin, and even phase, uh, phase separation when you consider membrane-mediated uh, 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 membrane, uh, proteins. Uh, here, the red particles represents uh, proteins, right? So this kind of simulation involves large conformational and topological changes. So continuum model cannot do that. Do that. So compare our simulation results with the existing uh, uh, experiments. Uh, the comparison is great. One thing we found that uh, for protein mediated uh, 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 interaction on the cell membrane, we found a very important phen phenomena. Uh, these red domains are curved. And when they are curved, they, they start to attract each other, uh, uh, displacing this uh, curved attract phenomena. So um, several years later, G and I are working on replications on, in graphene. That's vapors and dislocation combined on the, uh, on the 2D, 2D material. And we show the same 
uh, curve to attract principle. We published that paper in 2015, nine letters. So in 2013, uh, when I chatted with Ju in his office in MIT, we received a call from Lian Tilly from Australia. She asked us whether we can use our model, our member model study malaria infection with her. Tilly is a worldwide uh, leader in malaria community. The collab collaboration immediately clicked. So in malaria community, it's widely known that during the disease causing stage, the parasite infected red blood cell is very stiff and could be one order from magnitude stiffer than the health cells. This causes blockage of small vessels, uh, deficiency for oxygen transport, and in severe cases, death. It is also well known that during the disease transmission stage, the infected cells become reversibly deformable, reappear in the circulating blood, uh, blood uh, stream, and getting ready to be picked up by, by mosquitoes, mosquitoes for disease transmission. But none knows why. None knows why, right? So we decided to build a whole red blood cell model, a health and, uh, and uh, in fact, to tackle this problem. So a health red blood cell uh, is really a hybrid structure with a lipid ballet on the top, a meshwork called the spectral network uh, on the bottom. The uh, building block for the spectral network is a tetramer linked at the actin uh, junctional complex, right? Between the uh, lipid bilayer and spectrum network, we have this uh, vertical uh, uh, connections as shown here, right? So uh, this uh, vertical linkages really stabilize the structure. Now, in axial or disease causing stage, the parasite import proteins to change the structure of both lipid bilayer and spectral network. In particular, these proteins, uh, this protein aggregates uh, form knob-like a structure as shown here uh, on, the same, on the same membrane with radius changing as disease progresses, right? And this, uh, this, this, uh, this novel is also a platform for the presentation of the cytoadherence protein. So that makes the cell very sticky, right? For spectrons, chance, uh, they found that 20% of acting junctions complex uh, get lost and that changes the connectivity of, of the spectral network. And due to the presence of the knobs, of course, the linkages between the sprung tender work and the and lipid bilayer also change. Right? So we build a coarse grained model by following the structure uh, blueprint of the healthy and the infected cells. Here, the green particles represent the normal lipid bilayer, yellow for knobs, purple for uh, spectral network. Right? Of course, we take into account the normal, uh, the, the vertical connection uh, changes. And uh, I'm not going to show you the detailed simulation results. What I'm going to show you here uh, are, are, are really the fascinating mechanisms why this disease is so fatal from a mechanics point of view. It turns out that the parasite implemented three material principles simultaneously to stiff the cell. First, the compositing, um, because the knob is very stiff and where the surrounding lipid is, is, is viscous, right? So this is a comp composite material. Second, the size dependence as the, as the um, disease progresses, uh, the knob size decreases, the smaller, the stronger, right? And third, uh, the spectral network is really a spring hopping material. So we will share this, uh, this same membrane um, because the knob region uh, is very stiff. So all the shear goes to the spectral network in the knob free region. Um, because this uh, spectral network is a straight hard material, this makes it stiff, right? So um, this makes it very stiff. Uh, this paper was published in 2015, the same year U UU2 awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for her, uh, for her discovery of the famous Chinese herb uh, to cure the malaria. And I found, I found out later that uh, UU2 actually made the discovery uh, back in 1972. Uh, that's exactly the year that I was born. Um, so uh, that was the first time I feel that I was so close to Nobel Prize. So during the disease uh, transmission stage, so at stage three, uh, the, the cell becomes very stiff so that the cells are sequestered in spleen. At stage five, uh, it become deformable again and reappear in the bloodstream. Okay, I 
I will not go into details of our analysis. Leon Tilly did a great job on imaging the microstructure changes and the rationalization uh, from the experimental evidence. We found that in these cases, the parasite actually can manipulate the configurational entropy of the spectral network because uh, the spectral network, the tetramo is very fluffy, right? Uh, and you control the configurational entropy of the spectral network so that to alter this, uh, the membrane stiffness. During the third st stage three, uh, the imported protein uh, on the cell membrane increases the vertical and the lateral confinement on the, on, on spe on the spectral network, thus lowering the configurational entropy and stiffening the cell. Uh, during the stage five, uh, the opposite happened, okay? And, 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 uh, and, and thus the cell softened. And this work was published in uh, PNAS 2016. So another early and ongoing work uh, uh, for us is to understand the entry of nanoparticles to the cells. This work really inspired by the effective invasion of viruses to the human cells. Viruses, as shown here, take different shapes, sorry, and sizes, right? And we can, and this, uh, this, this, this virus can invade human cells in a very effective way and uh, a specific manner. Certain viruses only attack uh, uh, or target certain cells. While the, for synthetic nanoparticle based therapeutic agents we design, the target efficiency is very low. The adverse side effect is unacceptably high. So this is a, another example that nature made material outperforms engineering material. And uh, COVID-19 is another example, that, uh, another example. So it's very contagious. So it can invade human cells very effectively, okay? Uh, just a bad example, right? So uh, can we mimic the virus design high inf inf uh, highly infected, effective nanoparticles, okay? So this is uh, the you know, cytotic uh, pathways or, or process, right? Nanoparticles are here to the cell membrane uh, wrapped by the membrane and pinch off to deliver the nanoparticle into the cell. That's called in the cytosis. So, um, apparently, this process is driven by the Haitian energy, but penalized by the deformation energy, right? Uh, uh, deformation energy of the membrane. And that includes both the membrane bending and tensional energy, right? This membrane tension and bending uh, sets a characteristic length scale below, below this length scale, bending dominant. Beyond that uh, scale, uh, tension dominant. So you can apply the energy balance, uh, which gives rise to minimum particle size below which the bending energy panel is, is too high to be paid by the cell and nanoparticle will not uh, enter the cell. And that's a very simple analysis. Uh, when in the cytosis is the receptor mediated, uh, many interesting mechanisms emerge or uh, occur. First of all, the receptors can freely diffuse uh, within the membrane, right? So uh, diffusion takes time. That sets a characteristic uh, time scale for in, in the cytosis. Hua Jian and his co-workers co have worked out a beautiful uh, framework to, uh, to predict the endocytical time uh, as a function of nanoparticle size. They found that when nanoparticle size is about 25 nanometer in radius, the endocytical time is maximized, is minimized. So we start to ask a different question. How many nanoparticles would enter the cell if we place a cell in a cultural medium loaded with nanoparticles? I discussed this problem with Ju and Subra. Uh, at that time, I think Gan visited Subra at MIT and uh, Subra uh, chatted with Gan on this problem as well. Gan pointed out, this is a equ equally important problem. It is important because the number of nanoparticles that enter the cells determines the amount of drugs uh, the uh, amount of drug molecules that can tackle along, right? A low, a, a, a low dosage of drugs, of course, cannot kill the cell, right? So Gan has been uh, uh, working with us on this problem for a long time. And he has, uh, uh, Gan is right now in Rice University uh, as a department head. He has, uh, he has had a very successful transition from traditional mechanics to molecular biology, very interesting. To solve this problem, we noted that receptors can carry entropy. As the receptor rearrange due to the binding to the uh, ligands, uh, the entropy changes. That changes the energy landscape of radical process. So we developed a thermodynamic model to predict the cellular uptake. 
This model allows us to establish a phase diagram for uptake in terms of particle size and lichen density as shown here. There are three phases we identify a lichen shortage phase and a receptor shortage phase, right? For which nanoparticles cannot enter the cell. And the, in the satellite phase, phase, uh, 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 right? So can, the nanoparticle can enter the, can enter the cell, right? The lower bound phase boundary is just the, governed by the enthalpy that we discussed before. Uh, uh, and the, the upper boundary is actually determined by entropy. This paper was published in, in Advanced Materials 2009. Does shape matter? Of course, if you remember that viruses take different shapes, then there must be some reason behind this nature design uh, principles, uh, nature design uh, nanoparticles. Huajian and his co-workers observed that for, an, uh, for a nano, nanotube, tube entry is a typical mode, a typical entry mode. We launched a cost grain uh, simulation using our member model to rationalize the endocytic pathway. We found if the nanoparticle enters the cells by horizontal configuration, then the energy panelization will follow this red curve for purely uh, vertical entry. It, the energy penalty will follow the black curve. Of, of course, nanoparticle takes the path with the lowest energy penalty. Thus, the nanoparticle will first to lay down and then stand up. Okay, we we'll call this laying down to stand up pathway. And the Huajian uh, course of this paper with us and published in Nature uh, uh, Nano Lesson 2013. So our solvent dynamic model gives rise a closed form of cellular uptake of nanoparticles. This is probably the most cited equation in my research career uh, so far. That is, the cellular uptake n uh, takes a Boltzmann distribution, right? Uh, here r is the particle radius, and alpha is the adhesion energy density, and uh, omega is the mechanical energy density compared with KBT. So one would wonder, where does the entropic effect go, right? We found here the adhesion energy density has the entropic and the enthropic component due to the entropy of the receptors. So, uh, so that makes the adhesion energy density changes all the time, okay? It's a variable, it's not fixed. I still remember that GNI sat in his house in Philly and we worked out this problem very beautifully. Uh, it's really a, a, a joy uh, to work with G on this, right? So uh, you, can, you, clearly, you clearly see that the competing ma uh, mechanism of adhesion and definition in this formula, right? Alpha, in fact, uh, 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 with increasing adhesion energy density, adhesion energy density, the cellular uptake increases. This is precisely the way how mechanical targeting uh, works. Many biologists, Strive to find matching ligands for receptors on cancer cells so that to increase the adhesion energy density and to achieve specific targeting. That's called the chemical targeting, right? However, we want to point out two common misconceptions here. First, people tend to miss in this uh, to miss this uh, entropic effect. This entropic effect determines how many ligands or spikes you may want to code onto the nanoparticle. As you say, for viruses, there are dedicated number of ligands since the light density modulates the entropy of the receptors, okay? Not less, not more, right? Secondly, very importantly, people tend to miss the, the, the mechanical effect, which is the opposite side of the one coin. We argue that we can design a complementary targeting strategy through biased mecha mechanical deformation energy. Uh, luckily, many cancer cells are softer than normal cells, and this makes the idea of mechanical targeting very appealing. And my PhD student, Chang Junhuang, Chang Junhuang has working on this. Uh, the, uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Hong Yan has working on this. Uh, this. This is really a great idea, okay? So indeed, we demonstrate the feasibility of mechanical targeting. We measure the cellular uptake of fluorescent nanoparticles into the normal cells or health cells and metastatic cells because the metastatic cells are both softer and, and uh, uh, softer and uh, rounded and expose more area, area to nanoparticles. The cellular uptake uh, for this metastatic cells is about six times larger than the health ones. And this was work was published in Advanced Materials 2018. 
and appear in, in uh, uh, NSF Wiki News. So we were invited to write a review article uh, in 2015 uh, with uh, with Hua and Gan. So uh, we recently worked on the plant cell wall in collaboration collaboration with my colleague Daniel uh, Cosgrove. Professor uh, Cosgrove is a worldwide known plant biologist with keen interest in mechanics, and he has established a DOE NG, uh, uh, frontier center at Penn State. We recently developed a Cosgrove model uh, of the lamina of the plant pri primary uh, plant cell wall and showed how the collective in fact, uh, uh, elementary movements of cellulose fibers contribute to the extensibility, plasticity, and creep of the plant cell wall. And this cosplay model really said other models cannot and clarified a, a set of long standing questions or problems in the plant cell field. Yao is a postdoc called by Dan and myself. Yao is doing a fantastic job and uh, will land a factory position very soon. And here I just uh, show a, a website of Dan's uh, uh, center here. So let's move on to uh, um, adherent cells. When the cell adheres to the uh, extracellular matrix, the actual myosin motors powers the cell. The motor protein, which is not shown here, contract the actin, actin filaments, which are the muscles of the cell, uh, generating this contractile force uh, in the actin fibers. The uh, contractile forces are then transmitted to the neighboring cells through the cell cell adhesion junction, generating intercellular tension, and uh, to the substrate through a focal adhesion, generate, uh, generate extracellular traction. So there are three important active forces intracellular contraction, intercellular uh, tension, and extracellular traction. And of course, these forces are um, racked rack back to cell, generate cell body force. Uh, these forces are very tiny on the order of tens of nanonewtons. Nano uh, this imposes challenge to measure them. Many methods have been developed to measure the cell force. All these methods use a soft substrate to enforce the displacement caused by the cell forces. Uh, with the displacement field, we can back up the cell force, right? For instance, Harris used a silicon film and uh, um, Chris Chen uh, from BU uh, used, used to be in the uh, Yukon used in the nanopillar. Right, uh, micron pillar uh, array. Uh, but more commonly, we use the traction force microscopy to calculate the, uh, to measure the traction force. Uh, what traction force microscopy does is that you embed, embed a set of fluorescent beads into soft uh, sub substrate to track the displacements caused by the cell force. And then you will solve a reverse mechanics problem to find the traction. And then once you find the traction, you can and this traction will rack the back to cell monolayer, and you can solve another mechanical problem to find the cell body stress. That's called the monolayer stress microscopy. Um, Christian, uh, Christian Frank, now professor in University of uh, Wisconsin uh, with uh, Ravi uh, from Caltech, has extended the traction force microscopy uh, from 2D to quasi 3D and 3D. Uh, really impressive work. So uh, this traction force microscopy and monolayer stress microscopy are very expensive. We want to establish models to predict the cellular force. So uh, for a cell or for, for a cell monolayer, we have a mechanical equilibrium where traction force acting on the cell is approximated by, the, by a body force due to the thinness of the cell. In the cell, the constitutive relation of cell, cell is bo both passive and active. The active part resembles the thermal cooling uh, due to the contraction, and we also have the uh, soft traction uh, 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 acting on the periphery of the cell. Of course, you have the equilibrium condition for the substrate subject to the traction boundary condition. Now, linking these two sets of boundary, uh, uh, this two sets of the Garvey equation is the traction force, right? According to Newton's thought law, right? Without the traction force, you cannot solve this problem, right? So traction force is sustained collectively by the ligand receptor pairs uh, in the focal adhesion. Statistical mechanics tells us that the focal adhesion density exponentially scales with the potential energy of the integrins, okay, which is the receptors there. Right? 
Consider each ligand receptor as a linear spring. The potential energy has two parts, the elastic energy and the uh, traction force potential. And the potential uh, thus, uh, uh, the total potential is thus uh, uh, quadratically dependent on the stretch. Here stretch is really the uh, displacement, uh, displacement uh, uh, difference between the cell and the substrate. And that's also the stretch of the lichen receptor pairs, right? So you see here, the focal adhesion density is uh, nonlinear dependent on the stretch. And you also see that stretch stabilized focal adhesion. That really tells that uh, mechanics and the biochemistry actually couples together, right? So collectively, you can find the traction once you find the uh, focal adhesion density, right? And this uh, traction force is highly nonlinear, depend highly nonlinearly dependent on the uh, displacement field. As shown here, our nonlinear model uh, is actually uh, fits a little bit better than a linear model uh, as compared to, yeah, as shown here. Uh, we also, uh, for instance, stain the focal adhesions and the concentration of focal adhesions matches with the concentration of the, uh, of the traction force. So by matching the traction force profile with the experiments, we deduce that the active contractile stresses or forces scales with stiffness of the substrate. That means cell can feel the substrate or sense the substrate as respond by changing its contractility. With the increase in the Young's modulus of the substrate, the active contractility uh, monotonically increases and reaches a plateau, right? And this plateau is the limit of cell machinery, such as that our muscle can only generate a certain amount of force. So our model prediction of the traction force profile is in, in good uh, agreement with the traction force microscopy and the monolayer stress microscopy, right? Here I show that the first principle stress we predict uh, aligns with the orientation of stress fibers, that makes sense. And the concentrated traction we predict aligns with the focal adhesion concentration, uh, shown here. We have studied many cases on single cell level all matches well with traction force microscopy and monolayer stress micro microscopy. We extended our method to, the uh, uh, to simulate traction force and monolayer stress for multicellular structures, okay? We found that traction force and monolayer stress are both gel stiffness and colony size dependent. So you increase the gel stiffness, uh, the active con contractor force increases, uh, leading to the increased traction and the monolayer stress. With a decrease in the colony size, the um, surface tension effect becomes more pro uh, uh, predominant or pronounced, leading to the increase of traction and the monolayer layer stress. Not notably here, we treat the stiffness effect uh, as the active response of the cell, while the size effect as the passive response of the cell. So this figure looks very nice. What's the usage? So here comes a very interesting experiment done by my uh, 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 collaborator, Tahir Saif at uh, University of Illinois. So if you culture these human column cells on substrate of different stiffness, a very interesting thing happen, right? Tahir uh, observed that cells from, uh, form colonies of different sizes. And then when, the when, when, when we continue to, uh, continue to observe, we found that the individual cells would disperse from muscle island expecting a uh, metastatic ma phenotype. And this, uh, this uh, metastatic phenotype is both, uh, it's gel stiffness dependent. It occurs in stiff gels, but not soft ones. On soft gels, the, colonies, the colony remains cohesive. We, re we repeated the experiments. In addition to the gel stiffness de dependent, we also observed the colony size dependent. On the same gel, smaller colonies dispose earlier than the larger ones. On, on different gels, same size uh, colonies dispersed earlier on stiffer gels. So previously, we found that traction force and monolayer stress are both substrate stiffness and colony size dependent. So the question to us is that, are there any correlations between the force and the metastatic phenotype, right? So if you look at the stress calculation or force calculation, the correlations between metastatic phenotype and the force, that's the question we're asking. So um, we integrate our experimental data and modeling data to form a phase diagram of the uh, phenotypes in the plane of the colony size and gel stiffness. 
So uh, if you have a dispositive or metastatic phenotype, we denoted as a triangle. For cohesive phenotype from the experiment, we denoted it by circle. We can also calculate the tracking force and denoted by this uh, uh, color map. We found that separating uh, these uh, phenotypes is a constant tracking force as shown here. Um, right? Yeah, it's constant tracking force. Below this tracking force, you have cohesive phenotype. Beyond, you have dispersive or metastatic phenotype. This really demonstrates a mechanical marker for in vitro metastasis. Very similar to our Griffith's law in fraction mechanics, when we apply load, when they apply load exceeds to critical load, crack propagates. Here, when the tracking force reaches uh, beyond, uh, exceeds the, uh, uh, the, the, the threshold, this portion will occur, right? Uh, this work was, uh, was reviewed by nature physicists for nearly two years. Um, uh, but these people are asking me, uh, asked us to, fi to, to, to fi figure out the biochemical signaling pathways that uh, we have no, uh, <laughs> uh, no capability of doing that. Uh, it's very complicated. So this round, this people was, uh, uh, it's a very stressful experience. Um, yeah. So this paper was later on published in uh, uh, Software Matter. So let's switch gears to uh, gap closure. Uh, cell and tissues uh, have great cell uh, uh, healing capability. Uh, Jin Yang and I in Penn State started a project to understand and promote uh, a nerve uh, regeneration. Right? There are two classical uh, healing uh, mechanism or gap closure mechanism for adhesive gaps, right? Uh, for adhesive gaps, Healing is enabled by active cell migration, right? Uh, so proliferating cells simply migrate into the uh, gap area. For non-adhesive gaps, cells invoke di uh, 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 di different mechanism. Basically, cell will for cells will for force to form an acting cable at the front, and then the acting cable contract to pull over, close the gap, okay? So uh, really, fourth generation, fourth generation in these two mechanisms are very different. Uh, cell crowding is like home walking, right? Uh, generate outward uh, traction uh, to a substrate. And acting cable uh, contraction is like zipping up our pores. Uh, generate inward traction to a substrate. And if you look, if you consider the traction is really the friction force between the cell monolayer and substrate, and this uh, direction of the forces is really just a relative motion of these two. Um, so we are pattern the cell colonies with different uh, non adhesive gaps, different size, different shapes. We simply observe how they respond to these gaps. We found for small gaps, cell can close it. For large gaps, the closure probability is much smaller, as shown here. And this shows the uh, closure kinetics, okay? So again, you have size dependence. Um, uh, from our, our confocal image, we show that for large gaps, say 100 micron in radius, iron cables form at the gap front, as shown here, right? Some cells try to invade the, uh, the, the, the gap by touching to the gap front, but this trend cannot proceed. Uh, and after one layer attachment, the heating stops or gap closure stops. For small gaps, say 50, uh, 50 micron in radius, we observe continual, uh, continuous attachment of cell to the gap front, until the gap fully uh, closed. Very interestingly, we found that during the gap closure process, the acting cable sometimes broken, uh, segmented, not uniform. Sometimes two sets of uh, acting cables appear as shown here, right? Uh, uh, showing the front and back. This is very different from the classical uh, post-string contraction mechanism. This motivated us to look at what happened at the gap front. So if you uh, uh, look at the uh, traction force dynamics during the closure process, for small gaps, the traction force is forced outward right here, blacker, and then switch to inward. This inward traction force continues to rise until gap closes. So this magnitude of traction force indicates that the contractile force in the acting ring keeps increasing. For large gaps here, um, the traction force appears to be uh, outward and then inward. 
And then it gets uh, 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 frustrated and switch back to outward again, right? That suggests this acting cable is not powerful enough to close the, uh, to close the gap. For elliptical gaps, closure occurs first at the, uh, across at the high coffee region and the gaps become circular-like. After that, closure is much like a circular shaped uh, uh, gap. Uh, I'll skip this one. Um, using live cell imaging, we observe a new mechanism. That is, the acting ring segment can be switched, updated at the gap front uh, by acting uh, segment, uh, segment diffusion and fusion, as shown in this time lapse uh, images. What you see here is that swapping of the positions of the red and, uh, and, 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 and the blue cells. Owing to this swapping, the acting ring segment also gets switched from the, uh, between the cells. And this is mechanism, mechanism that has never been reported before. So we uh, show the schematics of this mechanism here, starting um, uh, from the gap with the form of the acting cable, uh, the proliferated pressure push the cell to the front, shown here, and cell start to uh, attach the, uh, to the acting cable. Newly attached uh, cell contract, right, as shown here, Tract contraction force apply, or apply to, the, to this uh, uh, acting cable, uh, acting cable. The contraction is compressive, right? The uh, compression, uh, compression activates depolarization of the acting cables, okay? So the acting segment diffuse from the old cell. Uh, that's the diffusion process. The rest of the acting cable stretch the new cell. And the stretching operating up, up regulates, up regulate, up regulates the acting polarization. And new acting uh, segments established in this new cell. Uh, and then fuse into the whole acting cable. So the acting cable is one step forward to the close the gap. And these two process, the sub process, or you can call it the positive feedback loop continues until the gap closes. So this is a very complicated and but interesting phenomenon. So why is size dependent? We know that the acting segment switching depends on whether or not cell contraction is strong enough to activate the depolymerization. Right? So apparently a concave curvature, a uh, concavely curved segment is easier to buckle than a straight or uh, than a uh, convexly curved segment. That is, the larger the concave curvature, the, the easier uh, for the compressed segment to buckle and the easier to activate depolarization because of the activation barrier is uh, slower. And this explains the size effect or coverage effect. So the gap closure depends on how strong the contraction of the newly attached cells is. If it's strong enough, it will trigger a cascade of acting diffusion and fusion process until, gas, uh, until the gap closes. This interdependency of acting seg segment in gap closure resembles the, the old tail of the monkey heading tail uh, trying to uh, catch the moon in the well. Okay, that's just a uh, analogy. Of course, we developed a kinetic model to predict the uh, non-adhesive gap closure. If the, uh, 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 yeah, this, uh, this model is simply a balance, uh, force balance uh, between the active acting contraction uh, with the viscous drag. Um, yeah, if you have, uh, have both a post-strain contraction and cell attachment, uh, you have to exclude uh, uh, the, uh, the active cell attachment from the viscous force, right? So our model much, uh, uh, agrees with uh, experimental data uh, very well for all the cases. And uh, indeed it predicts that um, uh, cultural, uh, 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 it also predicts that uh, gap closure starts at high culture region for elliptical uh, shift uh, gaps. And this people is uh, just uh, imprint in PNAS. So let me say how many minutes I have. I have seven minutes. I'm not sure that I can finish it up. So how about curves? So we enjoy curves as shown here. How about cell, right? Uh, how cell sense recognize and navigate around curvatures? 
So experiments have established, and I have shown you before a little bit, when cell meet a negative curvature, cell can assemble acting cables and pull the cell forward, right? Pull cell forward. And when cell meet a uh, positive curvature, cell will form focal adhesion at the front and extend this uh, uh, lambda podium uh, for migration over adhesive beds. Uh, what is fascinating to me is that how cell sense and makes decision when encountering this curvature. We know that engineers can build a bridge over rivers and valleys by assembling load bearing components such as beams and ropes in the right place. Without a central uh, organizing system, how cell can build this infrastructure such as acting cables and focal adhesions selectively in response to the external stimuli to navigate around curvatures? And this is a question that I don't think that anybody have asked before. What I really want to show you here is that cell are able to direct energy and mass flows in response to the external stimuli such as curvature. And the flows through a highly irreversible process can achieve order in, stack, uh, in a very selective manner in the cells, right? Of course, uh, here, traction uh, matters, the source of tension matters. You want to ma measure the traction? My student, Xue uh, Sheng, actually measured the traction using the Newman triangle, uh, Newman, uh, Newman triangle measurement. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this here. Uh, I really want to talk about this uh, coil taxis, how cell sense and navigate the curvatures, right? So when cell uh, encounter a negative curvature, right? Uh, simultaneously, you have this uh, 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 soft tension, right? Soft tension. Uh, uh, and then once you have soft tension, young Laplace equation applies, which says that across the front line, across the front line, the, uh, uh, the difference of inner and outer pressure is balanced by soft tension, right? Um, and it will generate a pressure difference inside the cytosol, okay? Inside the cytosol. And uh, high in the remote and low on the curved region. According to the Gibbs-Thompson equation, this pressure difference will give rise to the chemical potential difference, which drives the motor proteins and the acting mo motors. Uh, to the quad front. As a result, acting cable forms at the at the at the at, at, at the quad front. Interestingly, once you have this uh, acting cable, the acting cable contracts in the same direction as soft tension, thus increasing the soft tension, making the pressure difference even higher and the cable potential difference even larger. This creates a positive feedback loop, right? As a result, the cable thickens and putting the cell forward. When the cell meet the positive curvature, the pressure difference is opposite. The motor proteins want to flow to the curved region. Instead, to balance the source tension, uh, cell develops this transient focal adhesion dots. Receptors in the focal adhesion points are under tension, and tension lowers their chemical potential. As a result, receptor form uh, receptor forms at front, right at cold front, and form forming this uh, focal adhesion plaque. Uh, uh, this also form a uh, positive feedback loop uh, and uh, to enhance the forward adhesion at the cold front, okay? So really this boils down to an extended uh, young Laplace equation, right? Uh, here you have soft tension or, uh, or, or, or acting cable contraction, you have delta P, you have the uh, 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 traction, right? Uh, definitely all these three uh, things are dynamically changing during this process. So uh, leading this uh, bifurcation process. So you can describe this process using the phase field model. We developed a phase field model and Tienkai did a great job on this. Right, we have three phases. U is the def uh, deformation field and it's governed the mechanics. And C is the concentration field of the motor proteins. It really actually tracks the uh, 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 acting filament uh, assembly, and also the uh, intracellular traction, contraction, and then the uh, concentration field of the integrase that tracks the focal adhesion uh, uh, points and also the traction force, right? Uh, using some model, we can simulate this uh, bifurcation behavior, right? 
with when cell uh, encounters a negative curvature, positive curvature, and how the direct flows uh, or redirect flows and direct, redirect the energy. We also um, simulated um, simulate the transition between positive and negative curvature of an individual cell at the code front. Apparently, multiple proteins for flow from the convex to concave region while integrates flow in the opposite direction. We even studied how collective cell curvature sensing uh, works by tuning the intercellular tension, right? If the intercellular tension is very huge, we say this is the collective sensing. If intercellular tension is zero, that's essentially an individual cell culture sensing. Uh, we found from our simulation that collective sensing of cells is much more effective than individual sensing. So let me see. I'm right on time. This is my last page. So before I uh, mention about the takeaway uh, message, I would like to invite you to enjoy this movie, this video. <laughs> So I want to ask the audience, how many ways people here are interacting or communicating, right? A very simple question. So you say that people are yelling, laughing, right? They communicate through oral, uh, you know, oral language, I mean, right? And you say people are hand in hand, uh, right? That's a direct physical contact, direct physical interaction, right? And that's physical language. Right? But there's one very important communication uh, uh, method that we cannot ignore. And that is what makes this video very interesting. These people interact through the soft flexible bridge, even though they are not in direct physical contact. Right? Cell does this too. Paul, Jimmy, Dennis Disher, Chris Chen, and Vivek Shanai from UPenn, and a, G, uh, a guy uh, Ganin from WashU has established a center to work on the crosstalk between the cells and the substrate. Okay? And uh, they are, uh, they are making a tremendous uh, uh, progress. And the progress uh, in this field is very exciting. Okay? So the take home message is that living matters are soft, active, and uh, usually outperform, outperform uh, engineering materials. Living materials live through a flow of matter and energy, dissipate the energy through irreversible process as destroyers of order near equilibrium and creators of order far from equilibrium. So we need to use a non-equilibrium uh, uh, or some dynamic, we need to study this uh, some dynamic irreversible processes. Living organisms are multilingual, okay? They respond uh, chemical, mechanical, electrical, you name it, all these cues, right? They talk in this language, mechanical language, all the cells can comprehend, uh, can interact through this uh, mechanical language. And mechanical uh, biology is a new field at the boundary of mechanics and life science, poses fundamental questions and new opportunities for mechanics and uh, biology community. We want to stay stressed. Thank you all. I especially uh, thank you for all the people from all the uh, world. This is a really a extraordinary uh, gathering. Thank you all, indeed. Thank you, Sulin. Uh, can I ask you to unshare your slides so that we can see the panel? Um, if you are on the panel, uh, you can click the uh, uh, participants button in the bottom of your Zoom window. You will see on the right sidebar uh, at the bottom, you will see a, a raise hand button. If you have a question, click that button. Um, we'll put you in the queue. So Tahir, go ahead. Tulin, very, very nice. You have covered a huge 
uh, spectrum of findings and lots of food for thought. Um, quick question is, you know, I have noticed in your videos and your still images before that when the wound is healed, the actin network or the filamentous actin that is kind of helping to bridge the gap, they seem to cross from cell to cell to cell to forming a continuous ring or continuous um, fiber, if you will, or continuous rope. So how does this actin ring or actin rope uh, goes from one cell to the other? Because there's a cell to cell junction, which could be gap junctions or some uh, some membrane between the two. So it looks like there is a higher level of coordination where this filamentous actin can cross the boundaries between the cells and still provide this you know, fairly coordinated dynamics. Any thought on that? Yes, I, I think I probably didn't do a good job in explaining that. That's exactly the question that I, we are asking. That's exactly the question that we resolved. So basically, first the cells will attach, new cells will attach the front, basically attach on the uh, 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 acting cable, okay? And this, uh, this attach, newly attached cells will apply compressive forces to the, to the, to the acting uh, ring segment behind. So basically compress it. You know that, I, I think that people in biology knows that compression will depolarize acting. Right, right. Okay? So it will depolarize the old acting segment. And because the new cells get anchored to the rest of the acting ring, it gets stretched. And stretching actually promotes acting polarization. So new acting segment established in the, in the new cells. That's how it gets updated one by one and shrinking the, the, the acting ring. But that's within a given cell, right? I, I, I understood that concept. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how does the actin ring within a given cell interacts with the actin ring of the adjacent cell? Because it has to transverse the, it has to go to the membranal boundaries, right? Exactly. So within, uh, yeah, within the cell, I could fully understand the, the argument, but it's not clear to me how between cells, how does that propagate the information? There must uh, be some higher level, some hierarchical interactions, right? Uh, I think that's probably due to the cell cell adhesion junction. So between the cells, cell cell adhesion junctions connects the acting, acting segments. I don't know because I didn't study that, uh, mm -hmm. but I guess uh, cell cell adhesion junction will uh, connect the, mm -hmm. uh, the acting segments for individual cells to form this uh, continuous ring. That's a, certainly a very interesting question to ask to, to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for those of you on the panel, I'll update the uh, queue list of questions in the chat. So please watch that. The next one will be Guijin. Guijin, please. Uh, hi, Professor Zhang. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. So, uh, I'm I'm learned a lot from your talk, also from your research. Uh, I have a very general question. So, even in biomechanics, your research is already very diverse. I'm curious, how do you identify all these kind of uh, interesting and important questions, or topics, and make so many contributions in the field? So, maybe uh, inspire to us. Uh, thank you. So. Thank you for nice work. Uh, nice words to me. I think um, crosstalk with uh, with uh, with biologists, chemists, material scientists uh, is the key. Is the key. So uh, uh, so uh, I have never thought that I would uh, work on this kind of problems like uh, um, uh, after my graduation or uh, after my post working, right? But it just keep uh, keep yourself open open minded, right? Um, um, uh, a new opportunity will come, right? Okay. So, okay, Gui, uh, Gui Jin and all other uh, uh, people will be asking questions. Uh, please also, before you ask a question, mention your name and also your uh, affiliation, uh, which institution are you in? Uh, 
Okay. We'll let people know you. Guixing, do you, you can uh, still uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from, you are and where you are. I'm from uh, Institute of High Performance Computing in Singapore. Okay. Thank okay. you for your question. Okay, next, uh, Robin, go ahead. Hi, Professor John. So very nice talk. I enjoyed a lot. I um, it's a learn a lot. So the question is, as someone who's not in the field, but very interested, and also very interested in statistical mechanics, um, since you mentioned the cell system, bio system is not a thermodynamic system, right? So then what's the often in modeling or thinking about this process, what's the driving force you put in your simulations or models? And is there a general way of doing this? Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that's a thermodynamic uh, uh, system. It's a still, uh, uh, according to uh, Professor Long Ching Cheng, I learned a lot from him. Everything is thermodynamics, okay? It's okay. just you have uh, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics or non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So for um, for the biosystems, uh, because you have a constant uh, energy consumption, energy dissipation, so this system undergoing this uh, so-called non uh, 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 irreversible thermodynamical processes, right? So the driving force, of course, for for instance, for uh, it's just uh, it's just the the the. the uh, uh, chemical potential, right? For diffusion, right? Chemical potential difference that drives the flow, right? Uh, for instance. Uh, so uh, I think the framework worked out quite well uh, uh, in the framework, uh, in the, in the re regime of uh, non equilibrium uh, thermodynamics. Uh, it's just that usually uh, for near equilibrium uh, processes, we usually use this uh, uh, linear law, linear kinetic law. But for this uh, far from uh, equilibrium processes, uh, maybe this linear kinetic law is no longer uh, 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 hold. So you need to uh, come up with some uh, 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 non-linear kinetic laws, right? I think uh, my collaborator, Julie, is very good at this. You know, I also learned a lot from him, <laughs> right? So uh, yeah. So uh, there's a there's good uh, framework there. I just, uh, I just use this framework. So do you think there's any intelligence embedded in these cells and the cell nucleus, for example, that provide additional mechanisms or physics in this process? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, what I'm fascinated about cells, this living system is the uh, is is the, the cross talk? Is the the is the, they constantly implement this uh, this uh, very tricky uh, feedback loop to make things happen, to move things around, uh, to maintain itself, right? So for that that material, you don't you don't have to maintain itself, right? So you you crack it, crack it, right? For living system, you need to maintain to survive, right? So what, 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 yeah, exactly what I'm fascinated about the living system is this uh, feedback loop. In this loop, uh, this living systems actually invoke all kinds of irreversible processes, uh, you know, diffusion, uh, energy, uh, I mean, uh, 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 thermal conduction, et cetera, right? Uh, so it's very smart, it's very smart. For instance, how the cells, uh, navigates uh, through these uh, curvatures, right? It can build specific infrastructures like our bridge engineers, right? So, uh, so that's why I, I, I feel very interested about that, you know? And to write down a equation um, to reflect this kind of uh, feedback loop is very challenging, but very interesting to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, for your question. Robin is currently a postdoc at Caltech. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> assistant professor at uh, Northeastern University. Um, OK, Jing Yan, next. Uh, please introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jing Yan. I'm an assistant professor at Yale University. I work with Zuli on bacterial biofilms. So uh, I'm an experimentalist. So, and then Zuli provide a lot of uh, theoretical guide to our tools. Uh, experiment. Thank you, Siling, for, for your help and uh, for your wonderful talk today. 
have uh, two related questions in your last part of the talk about the cover taxes. So the first thing is that I can see you talk about this interesting positive feedback loop that uh, then the cells will just be more and more curved. Is any thing that stop this positive feedback loop so that the cells are not stretched into long, you know, thin shape? Uh, of course, uh, uh, still has the limit of, uh, of, of its own uh, machinery, right? For instance, if a cell establish this uh, uh, arcing cables at front, right? It depends on how many uh, 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 multiple genes can flow to that region to stretch the acting cables. So there's a limit. There's a, uh, there's oh, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a limit. That's not a mechanical limit. It's not like the cell cannot be uh, that curved. It's more like a chemical limit where the, you have you you run out of the machinery to generate. That's yes, true. that's a, that's the chemical limit. Yeah, okay, the biochemical limit. Right. But but the, that, that's a biochemical limit also limiting the the amount of the the, the the magnitude of the contract contraction. Yeah. So this is a chemical the limit to, to the mechanical limit. Same thing, mm -hmm. same thing, same thing as a full cohesion, right? So uh, the full cohesion, you need to. You need to flow enough uh, uh, receptors to the front to to form these fortification uh, points, right? So for the, then fortification will contract, will, will pull the substrate to form uh, to, to generate traction. So again, this is a there, there is a chemical limit that lead to the mechanical limit of traction force. Yeah. Cool. So the related question is that so if the, the if the cells are uh, both unstable towards positive curvature and, and negative curvature, and that means like a flat interface will not be stable. And I guess there, is a, and then there must be a, some stabilization force is that the cells out easier will try to flatten the surface where the, the inherent behavior is going to generate, a, generate a instability and that will generate, maybe you can predict the wavelengths of the expanding cell front. That's a very, that's a great question that I'm still thinking, <laughs> trying to think out, right? So uh, what create the, 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 if you have, if you have a front, like a thin film, this really front, you, you have this oscillating. How cell control this oscillating or fluctuation in the, in the curve? I, I'm still thinking about this problem. I'm writing this paper. Maybe I invited you to call this paper. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. It just seems to me like it's like a, it, it seems to me you should be able to predict some wavelength dependence, wavelengths that depending on the activity and also the location, they can predict the experimental result very well. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk offline on Friday. Yeah, right, right. This is a, this is great. This is a great, uh, great question. I, I, actually, that's a question that I have. I'm writing this manuscript. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, next, uh, Jing Du. Uh, Jing, hey, hello. I'm Jin Jin Du. I'm an assistant professor also from uh, Penn State University. I also studied uh, biomechanics, uh, but mostly of heart tissues. So yeah, Suling, uh, thanks a lot. This is a wonderful talk. I have listened to your talk for several times, but every time I found it amazing. Especially I like your comments about that. We are all doomed to be stressed, right? Including the cells. And I think it also applies uh, for us. Anyway, uh, I have a technical question. You have mentioned that uh, your model can be applied to study a lot of different uh, uh, practical uh, questions. You have mentioned uh, different uh, types of uh, virus. In one of your slides, you even mentioned the COVID-19 virus. And also a lot of uh, different model parameters, you have uh, studied them. Then how about uh, different types of particles that's trying to go into the cells? For example, if you are going to simulate this virus and that virus, what's the differences in your coarse grain model? How are you going to capture the difference there? I know they're all totally different. Then what's the key parameter here in those particles or say viruses? Yeah, um, uh, good question. Uh, actually, that's the exact question that we're trying to answer in our research. So we consider different kind of uh, particles, uh, maybe in the shape and size of the viruses, right? So you have a uh, spherical nanoparticles coated with ligands uh, of different numbers and uh, different size, and you have a uh, uh, spherical cylindrical nanoparticles, uh, right? So so yeah, we, uh, we we found that the size and the shape uh, matter a lot, and also uh, the softness of the nanoparticles 
if the nanoparticle is stopped during this wrapping process, uh, the energy will have a partition uh, both to the cell membrane and the nanoparticles. And uh, I think Hua Jin have done some work on that. Uh, uh, yeah, right. We have done that offline. We didn't publish anything there. Uh, just uh, we found that's not very significant or we run out of time. Yeah, so we consider all kinds of uh, chemical uh, chemical uh, uh, properties and the mechanical properties of nanoparticles uh, in our simulation. And we can do that. We can cross grain the nanoparticles the same way we, can, uh, we cross grain the uh, cell membrane. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Ke Jie. Thank you, Tang. Thank you, Sulin. Very interesting, many aspects. As the KG Jog here, I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering. Good morning, everyone from Purdue. Um, Sulin, I have a, a, a list of questions, actually, but I'll be cut off at some point. So let me start with a couple of technical questions and maybe one general question. So one technical question regarding modeling is that uh, uh, for the soft material uh, modeling, it's particularly challenging because um, very often those weak forces are more crucial to than the strong forces um, to model their phase and morphological behavior, like one force interactions and, and electrostatic interactions. So in your modeling, how do you deal with those weak forces? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, we, we cannot deal with this weak forces. Uh, uh, so so uh, you see these weak forces, uh, we talk about uh, forces that uh, matters at, at the normal uh, energy level of KDT, right? So in that case, this uh, uh, entropy uh, are actually uh, uh, very important. Because otherwise, that you say that uh, a constant relation about the entropy property is bad. That's for one. Uh, molecular dynamic simulations can capture uh, all kinds of uh, uh, weak forces, uh, for sure, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, for the yeah, for the uh, for the uh, for this adherent cells, you see that the traction force and the contractility contractility of the cell is just a collective, uh, uh, just a collective forces of the individual ligand receptor pairs or a single multiple team contra contractility. So we treat it as a continuum uh, distribution of the forces, right? Uh, even though we sometimes are looking into the microstructure, right? I think the same way that we treat uh, uh, in general uh, mechanics uh, framework, microstructure-based uh, model, right? Okay, okay, yeah. Regarding the uh, experiments, uh, experimental measurement of the forces, you mentioned the uh, traction force microscopy, um, and um, it's a kind of inverse approach. Um, but I guess that uh, uh, in order to extract the value of the four uh, stresses, uh, that needs a constitutive uh, behavior of those living system or cells. Uh, so how, how do you get those constitutive relationship for those uh, biological systems? Uh, no, in the, in the current, uh, uh, as far as I know, in the moon layer stress, uh, you talk about the moon layer stress microscopy, that's actually calculating the, uh, uh, the uh, the, the, the stress inside the cell, right? Traction force microscopy, you don't have any problem because the traction force is acting on the on the substrate, also rack back to the cell, right? So, uh, so, so the traction force microscopy, uh, yes, you don't have this issue. For the for the moon layer stress, that's the stress level inside the cell. I don't think that people using any activeness, uh, the, the constitutive law, they don't put this acting active contractivity into this uh, constitutive law. How we are in our modeling, we do that. Uh, we, we do uh, uh, reduce this uh, constitutive law, including both parts, the, uh, uh, passive, uh, the passive part and the active part. Active part is treated as a thermal cooling, a thermal cooling and thermal stress or thermal strain, right? So uh, yeah, uh, so that's it. So, so uh, uh, Chris, uh, Christian uh, Frank is here. Maybe he can uh, give us an a, 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 a update. Uh, but I don't think that people use this, uh, uh, this uh, active uh, constitutive relation in the molecular stress microscopy. Yeah, I was uh, just to clarify, I think uh, stress, are, stress is not a measurable quantity. Uh, strain is measurable quantity, or displacement is measurable. 
but uh, in order to calculate, in order to determine the stress, uh, we need a constitutive relationship, right? Yes, yes. So, so what I'm saying is that it, they just use this uh, to just treat cell one layer as a passive material. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. Tom, can I ask one more general question? Of course. Go ahead. Thank you. So I have just one because I'm not uh, uh, necessary within this field. So, but I'm working on mechanics coupled with chemistry, and um, I get to admit that uh, very often uh, we're overestimating so much the role of mechanics to chemistry or other things. Um, of course, we like to see that mechanics is important, but uh, uh, very often mechanics is not so important, admittedly. Um, so. Uh, for example, um, you talked about uh, this mechanics is, is competing with KBT, right? And uh, KBT is on the order of magnitude of pencil millibit. That actually requires significant stress. Uh, but for those uh, softer matters, very often you, you show that the stress is only like a Pascal or at most the kilopascal level. Um, how could uh, stress compete with those uh, thermodyna thermodynamic driving forces? Is this a simply a perturbation or it, on the energy landscape, it is really competitive to the chemical or biological chemical driving forces? So, so Koji, if you, if you look at a floppy uh, filaments, right? So uh, what I see here is that you have a so-called persistent lens, right? So uh, that's the mechanics couple, uh, uh, competing with the soma, soma, soma energy, right? Uh, so I, I think this competition uh, this condition is always uh, uh, always exists uh, in this sort of matter, right? Uh, uh, I think no doubt about that. Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'm out. Yeah. Thanks. Your next one in line is uh, Zi Chen. Thanks, Professor Li. Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Zi Chen from uh, Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College. Um, so, uh, so in, thank you very much for the stressful lecture. <laughs> uh, very inspiring. I uh, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, so my question is um, regarding the um, negative curvature. So I was wondering if it might be possible that, I mean, I, I know you talk about buckling but um, could it be that in some cases uh, it's because of the, um, I mean, due to the mechanics in the, during this the, um, cell migration, um, the, for example, the, the volume is, con uh, is nearly conserved. So in, in some cases it, it will develop a negative curvature because of that. So you're asking, um, you're asking, uh, how this negative curvature is formed? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I capture. Uh, the negative curvature uh, is basically, um, uh, uh, if you have a, a, a gap, if, if I have a circular gap, of course, cell will form this negative curvature at the front, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. you don't have, it doesn't have a choice. But if you have a, if you put cells on the adherent uh, substrate, uh, cell will randomly uh, form this negative uh, uh, positive curvatures, uh, uh, and that's that's the question goes to, uh, asked by uh, by Jin Yan uh, from Yale, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a cell will do this flocculating kind of behavior, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it will form this randomly to this this positive negative curvatures, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the regarding that uh, fluctuation, I wonder if the um, if it could be due to the you know protrusions like uh, lamellipodia, filopodia. Of course, if you have a positive culture, you have a con convex. Of course, it's due to the protrusion, this lamellipodia, mm -hmm. protrusions, right? Now, yeah. what I see here is the bifurcation uh, behavior. If I have a negative culture, the convex <laughs> or concave, or concave. If I have a, con have a concave. On mm -hmm. the cable front, you have the uh, acting cables. On the uh, at the at, at, at the uh, 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 convex uh, cables front, you have this uh, fluctuation. You know, so so cell can can switch between these two migration mode. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. 
Yeah, and I have another question regarding the um, the collective side migration. So I've been working with uh, Dr. Burke on um, collective side migration in cancer, and uh, and you probably know that uh, Lisa Manning and uh, Max B they previously have, have you know proposed this uh, cellular jamming and jamming transition. So I wonder if you could you can say a few words um, about uh, you know collective cell migration in in your system regard you know in, in the context of uh, jamming and jamming transition or, or the change of you know cell shape index. Yeah, we work a little bit on, on that. It's really a fascinating problem. So uh, uh, so this problem goes to you say this uh, ants uh, colonize. You know uh, you have this uh, uh, fish bull all kind of collective behavior emerge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, collective cell migration is one of the areas that we are trying to uh, get in. Uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, actually we're trying to do is to uh, form a framework to simulate this process, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, one thing that we, what we're trying to do is to, to see how these cells mm -hmm. communicate. Uh, through the source mm -hmm. of substrate and through the cell cell exchange junctions. And, but we have a difficulty to separate them, to decouple them, right? Uh, what kind of behavior is due to this cell cell exchange junction, this direct physical contact effect? Mm -hmm. or, uh, 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 or what kind of behavior is due to this cell cell communi communication through the source of substrate? Um, so because say, we consider that cell cell, cell through uh, cell, cell cell communications through the cell cell uh, 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 adhesion junction is more uh, more or less a chemical uh, uh, interaction. Whereas, mm -hmm. of course, there is a mechanical interaction, of course, there, right? I, we, we think there's more chemical interaction. Uh, cell cell interaction through the substrate is, is a, a purely mechanical interaction. We're trying to decouple them. Uh, it's a very, mm -hmm. it's very difficult problem because the force there is small, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, didn't, I didn't have time to talk about this. It's, it's, it's very interesting. We can talk about that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, work together on this problem. Now, yeah. it's a very great problem to work with. That would be fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Zhu, for your questions. Next in line, uh, Yaling, please. Oh, hi. Um, very nice talk, Suling. It's very impressive to see a computational person can take such beautiful uh, fluorescent image now. Um, and then Yang Lu from uh, Lehigh University. I have two questions. Uh, either one is that uh, looks like for your South Asian environment and your um, healing, you're, you're doing mostly like a two-dimensional consideration in your model. So my question is that, you know, like South Asian in, in body units in 3D gel uh, or 3D matrix, and also your own units a deep cut, right? Not a very thin layer. So is that in a uh, Collection with the three D real case, or what? What is missing that maybe not important or very important? So yeah, then that's why I don't get much energy funding, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just enjoying uh, this uh, this uh, model systems, and uh, a lot of people appreciate this the model systems. Um, I'm a newcomer uh, to biologists uh, working on this uh, mechanics relevant problem, and it, the question that you're asking is uh, really really relevant and important. And uh, again, uh, Christian Frank in Wisconsin, Madison, uh, he can measure this uh, uh, track and force microscopy uh, in 3D, right, or part of 3D. I, I think that, you know, we can do that. Uh, uh, we are learning from uh, Frank, we can do that. And also, yeah, for the one healing, uh, is we just consider the epicellular, epicellular layer uh, healing, right? Epicellular cell is on the surface, right? So uh, we, make, we usually make that argument. Uh, um, yeah, if the 3D, the, the, one healing is a very complicated process uh, involving many different kinds of uh, cells uh, coordinating uh, with each other, right? So uh, I don't think that I can get into that complexity. Right? I'm a model guy. <laughs> I, I enjoy uh, 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 looking at these model systems, right? Maybe we, we can carry out a more complex system later on as uh, we experience with the experiments. Yeah, very, right. very good question, yeah. 
Okay. My second question is even tougher along the same line. So uh, look, you, you do definitely provide a very good understanding about the problem, right? How the cell work, how it is function. And again, when you send me the same thing to NH, they always ask you, how does it help for the disease? Have you think about that, that line as well? Say, wood healing, right? You understand it well, how would you enhance or make the wood healing faster? Because that's always what people ask when you talk about the biomedical field. Exactly. That's why I try to expand my collaboration with uh, my uh, well, uh, in this field. So I'm working with um, with my colleague uh, uh, Jen Yang uh, in biomedical engineering to look at the node regeneration. Right? It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very trans, trans, uh, translational uh, uh, transformable uh, research, and uh, I'm working with. Uh, Bunch of poor pe people to uh, realize this mechanical targeting, right? Uh, what else? I'm also working with Qing Wang on ferroelectrical materials and trying to use these ferroelectrical materials uh, into this uh, bi biomedical, de biomedical devices. Uh, yeah, I I'm trying hard, but uh, I'm not sure that's my interest though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to, want to get any uh, NSF, uh, NIH funding, you, you've got to do some translational research. Uh, no doubt about that. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your questions, Yaling. Uh, next in line, Tian. Uh, Tian Tang. Uh, yes, uh, I was just unmuting myself. Uh, uh, thank you, Suling. Uh, a beautiful talk, and thanks for uh, sharing with us the in depth understanding of how cells work. Um, I would like to ask two questions as well, if I may. Um, the first is about your uh, coarse grain modeling. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Tian Tan from uh, University of Alberta in Canada. So my first question is about your coarse grain modeling. Uh, so as you uh, go from the all atom scale to coarse grain scale, you have to throw away some molecular details, right? And cell is very complicated. Even the lipids are very complicated. Uh, they can have different lengths, different uh, charge, saturation level, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the membrane, the cell membrane uh, is again, not just lipid and, and has other things in it. So um, how do you decide what details you would keep and, and what details you would have to throw away? Uh, so that's my first question. And my second question is, uh, uh, so I'm thinking if, a cell is in an environment that is uh, nutrient deficient. So if, if the cell is, is hungry, let's say, uh, how does that translate into a stress, a, a mechanical stress? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the last, uh, the, the second question first. If you don't have nutrient, so uh, cell will not be powered by the motor proteins. And the motor, your, your, your cell will lack of motor proteins to do contraction, okay? So they will not generate uh, uh, stresses and they will lose the stress um, homeostasis and they will die. Okay, very small, uh, small answer. So stress, you have to stay stressed. Cell has to stay stressed. Uh, for cost grain modeling, uh, I, I think that's a, just an experience. And you, you always, uh, for cost grain uh, modeling, I learned from uh, Pat Blaschko, for this kind of, uh, and also G, right? Uh, uh, for uh, cost grain modeling, um, yes, you have to throw some details. I have to keep some uh, uh, things uh, to make things happen, right? So, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's requires your physical uh, insight into the problem that you're working on, right? So if this problem, uh, for this problem, certain physics aspect you need to keep, you need to impart this physical aspect into your cost grain model. Otherwise you throw it away to, to make the cost grain model uh, efficient. Also this is the balance between the computational efficiency and, and the physical, uh, 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 physical, uh, 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 physical uh, soundness. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tian, for your questions. Next in line is uh, Changjing. 
Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Chan Jin. Uh, I'm actually one of the P former PhD students from Sulin's group. Uh, I'm now an assistant professor in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, same as all others, I'm very, uh, it's always uh, impressive uh, to, to see how uh, Sulin can uh, generalize the, the cell behavior using such elegant equations. Uh, we because I do experiments, I know uh, when you deal with cells, it's it's always uh, there are always uncertainties, and sometimes it can be very messy. Uh, so uh, I I actually have one technical question. So uh, in in the in the mechanical marker study where you see uh, the cell colonies, uh, which uh, that uh, that tends to uh, dis dissociate into uh, single cells. Uh, when the stress level uh, reaches a critical level, and that happens uh, when the cell colony is small. Uh, but we do know that in real biology system, uh, the tumors, they do not start uh, the met metastasis process until the tumor becomes very big. So it seems like the trend is opposite to uh, the real biology system. What do you think could be the uh, the reason that caused this uh, discrepancy. So the size effect in our model, uh, in our experiments, um, is actually uh, due to the uh, uh, surface uh, tension. Okay, uh, I think that surface tension or interfere tension exists uh, generally in any systems, uh, especially for this soft matter, uh, soft matter. So if you have a uh, cancer sulfuryl, cancer sulfuryl is also subject to tension, uh, soft tension. I think the discrepancy would comes from how much interfacial tension the real spheroid uh, will be uh, will be uh, experiencing. Uh, that depends on the uh, surrounding media of the spheroid. I bet that if you change the uh, chemistry of the surrounding media. Uh, of the spheroid, same thing will happen in vivo. Uh, the question then would be whether or not uh, such kind of environment will occur. So yes, in general, people find that the larger the uh, the larger this cancer uh, spheroid, the more likelihood uh, you would have for uh, metastasis. But that doesn't mean that the other side, the opposite side, will not occur. Okay, um, especially at the beginning of metastasis. Okay, some you say if you if you if you if you if you look at the uh, real case uh, metastasis. So yes, at the beginning of metastasis is uh, usually coming from the large spheroid, but the later stage when the cell uh, when the metastasis is very is widely spread in the body. I bet that this uh, this uh, metastasis also occur from small uh, spheroid. Okay, you just uh, look at different stages of cancer. Um, I, I I think I agree with you. Maybe so. Uh, maybe it's due to the diagnosis uh, technique that people always overlook those small tumors. So maybe metastasis already occurred, but people uh, don't did not, haven't detected. So. That's a great uh, argu uh, argument. Yes, yes. Maybe yeah. Sometimes we, you know, we, we cannot diagnose this small uh, spheroid and metastasis already occur. Yeah. So yes, maybe people cannot have a good. So we don't have a good technique to uh, detect this small spheroid, right? So the only thing that you observe is a large spheroid, right? Before you observe this uh, small. Uh, 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 spheroid to have uh, to have matter test to matter test to occur. <laughs> it's done, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, so may, maybe worse to start a set of experiments using three D uh, tumor spheroid, something like uh, a better system that uh, can mimic the real tumor uh, better than the two D system. We have already done that with the same using the same cell uh, cells cell type. We observe the same phenomenon. We just didn't uh, report it. Yeah, uh, we we did that. Yeah, I just I didn't see. 
Yeah, we saw, we saw exactly the same uh, stiffness and size dependent uh, metastasis behavior in 3D, cultural these cells in 3D uh, medium. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Changi, for the question. Uh, next, uh, Brian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Cox. Um, I'm an Australian person. I live in California. Um, so let's see, surely that was fantastic. I mean, what, what a um, almost encyclopedia of, of topics and ideas in, in the area. Uh, really uh, much there to think about. Uh, I'm trying to formulate a question. I've got two. I hope I can articulate them in a meaningful way. Uh, the first is uh, your observation and, and some other uh, numbers that um, the interactions in these cell systems tend to be around about a fortieth of uh, about a fortieth of an electron volt, somewhere around uh, kT. Uh, so um, that suggests that um, mechanical forces are going to be subject to pretty severe thermal fluctuations. Uh, and related to that, uh, if you do calculations of uh, strain energy uh, uh, rate uh, in moving cell systems, you tend to come up with the uh, result that the rate of change of the strain energy density uh, is orders of magnitude less than the uh, metabolic power of a cell. So, so once again, it suggests that from the cell's point of view, information it might get through mechanical force is kind of in the noise. Uh, so um, th that's, that's um, uh, question number one is, I, I suppose, uh, w whether um, 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 when, when you do, for example, uh, calculations of differential cell adhesion and look at aggregation as you did with your vesicles at the beginning of your talk, um, do you have concern about the possibility that those adhesive forces are too small to sustain a signal among your vesicles or amongst cells? Yeah, uh, Brian, this is a very good question. That's actually a question that we always ask. So, uh, so yes, a individual uh, 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 force, like a like the receptor peer, uh, this kind of force is a very small. Very small, but the cells can assemble uh, infrastructure and make a collective things happen. So if you look at the uh, uh, cell adhesion, so a uh, cell adhesion point, the adhesion uh, uh, point, is actually consists of is comprised of many such uh, lagrange receptor pairs to form a plaque, right? So yes, maybe individual lagrange receptor uh, interacting forces is small. Or the adhesion is small, but collectively it's not small, right? Same thing for uh, nanoparticle uh, 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 cell membrane interaction. It's essentially the same. Uh, when you call a bunch of ligands uh, on a uh, nanoparticle surface, and that ligands will collectively interact with the uh, 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 with the receptors. However, I do agree that when the receptor bind with the ligands, there are a lot of random noise there. Just you know, uh, cell uh, uh, exercise is a uh, uh, almost a, 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 a random motion to make this happen. But once it's click, it form a, 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 a huge, a large area to supply enough adhesion uh, uh, force, and that's why uh, entropy play a role there. Uh, uh, that's why we have an argument about this adhesion strength uh, is entropically driven. Uh, uh, beyond, uh, uh, besides this uh, enthalpic effect. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so, so thank you. That, that, I enjoyed that answer. And I think it leads um, to the second question, if I understand the answer correctly. So, so I think what you just described is that uh, you have a system uh, where you might have um, some receptors which would uh, suggest to a cell that it might take an action. And the cell uh, constructs a cytoskeletal um, networks, for example, in response to that, that more or less um, set in concrete the stimulus it just received from a variation in surface energy uh, that it has detected. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so it's, it's um, stabilizing the system by taking action, if I understand what you said. 
So, so that leads to uh, question number two. Uh, so the cells are active and they have a nucleus in them, which in many ways you could think of as a thinking entity. Uh, it can make decisions and change uh, the chemistry of the interior of the cell and uh, invoke uh, all kinds of actions within the cell, almost to, uh, without limit. So uh, here's the next question. Uh, do you see a, a way uh, of prescribing what, the, uh, what an active cell force will be, for example, uh, given some chemical or mechanical stimulus on the cell? Or, or are we, uh, at least at the moment, effectively limited to regarding the active forces the cell generates as something that we are going to assign by what amounts to a curve fit to the observations of some uh, experiment on the cell? Yeah, these forces, that's what patterns are really uh, uh, beautiful, beautifully uh, kind of, the pattern is, is, is uh, some have some regularities, but there are a lot of uh, noise there. Uh, that's the nature of uh, a soft matter or living systems. So I guess you're asking whether or not we can do a core fitting uh, for that. Um, well, it's pretty hard. We can only get the trend as I show you here. When, you, when we measure the tracking force, we see that the tracking force decays exponentially from the periphery to the, to the center on a uh, one layer, on one, one, one layer. So uh, uh, actually we're trying to uh, core fit in that. So I think the best core fitting is to do machine learning. So we, we produce a lot of uh, this kind of images experimentally and simulation wise. So this beautiful patterns in traction force, my uh, traction force profile and model layer stress profile. So I'm, uh, I'm asking my students work together to work out a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm to predict uh, the, 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 the trend or the map without actually going to the simulation. Uh, so that's what I, we're, we're trying to do. Uh, hopefully like a, a month or later, we can get some results. <laughs> I get one share with you. Uh, yeah, traditional core fitting doesn't work well. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Thanks, great question. Thank you, Brian, for your question. And also thank all our EML webinar friends from the West Coast joining us uh, in the early morning. So next, uh, Chang Xu. Hi everyone, my name is Chang Xu Miao. I'm the master student at Imperial College London. So I have a question uh, on the mechanical tele the telecommunication between cells. Maybe you have already partially answered this. And uh, as you know, that's uh, when cell contracts, it will uh, apply the traction force on the ECM or the subtract. So that means it will change the stiffness, will locally change the stiffness of the ECM. So, so my question is whether the, whether the non-linearity of the subtracts would play a very important role in the telecommunication? Uh, sure, uh, sure, of course. That's, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the, my colleagues in uh, European are, are devoting all the, their efforts to study this uh, uh, crosstalk between the cells and the substrate. The substrate is uh, soft, linear, nonlinear, and uh, uh, viscous, right? Uh, Paul Jimmy uh, uh, studying this uh, viscous effect, right? They even uh, consider this the time scales of cell fluctuation and time scales of the of the substrate. All the things matters. Yeah, all the things yeah. matter. And another thing, uh, uh, I want to challenge your experiment, experimental protocol because I saw that you uh, capture the cells are captured in proximity. So if there exists the mechanical telecommunication, uh, do you think it's necessary to separate the cells as far as possible? Great question. That I have a field experiments that I, I didn't show here. here. I have a postdoc, uh, not post uh, my, my, my former graduate student working on this problem very intensively, trying to understand how cell cell communication, how, uh, how cell cell communicate through the soft substrate, slowly from through the substrate. So what we did that we put the cells 
uh, put to appear of cells in the uh, very close uh, proximity, uh, uh, very very close by, and like a micron to micron uh, gap, and we measure and and they will kill one cell, right? And we measure the the changes of the other cell, right? We we couldn't find it. That makes you know. That's why I say this measuring the timing forces. This uh, this communication is very very challenging. So still ongoing that, that I will work on this for like a three three four years, and we didn't get any results. Okay. Uh, this is what, so so when you work on the uh, cell mechanics, this when you deal with this timing forces, the sense that you you don't always get this uh, result that you want it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. That's, that's a challenge problem that we worked on uh, for, for years. We didn't get any concrete results, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Changxi, for your questions. Uh, Su Lin, you better sit up tight now because uh, no the problem. Question yeah. or questions will be <laughs> coming from Professor Jimmy Jia. Jimmy, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, you put the pressure on me then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sulin, very good talk, uh, very interesting talk. I learned a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, I have to confess that uh, even when Sulin was a student in my group, I learned a lot of things from him. I learned more things from him than he learned from me. Uh, my question is somewhat similar to what Brian asked and also uh, certainly related to the comment uh, statement that Chang Jing made, and to a certain degree related to the second question that Tian asked. Uh, here's the uh, question. Uh, Brian asked, what exactly is the force in the cell? Okay, so you are talking about we're all in a stressed life, but different people have different tolerance for stress. You may have, you may enjoy a life which is uh, highly stressed. I enjoy a life which is lightly stressed. Cells may have the same preference, right? Some cells may have, uh, may, may, may be very comfortable in a highly stretched or highly stressed state. And uh, that would make them elongate, uh, you know, really pulling themselves. And so other cells may, uh, be more comfortable in a lightly stressed state. Uh, cells are messy, as Chang Jing mentioned. Another thing, you know, uh, Tian mentioned was, what about if you don't have nutrient? Okay, so when I'm, I'm tired, I prefer a very low stress state. So now the question is, uh, do cells have a set stress state that they would be more comfortable or most comfortable. I understand there's fluctuation, but the fluctuation is around that stress state or stress, uh, stress level. Related question is, is this set state, is it possible, you talk about cell contraction, is it possible that that set state for some cells are tensile, but for other cells, are compressive. Gave you an example, bone cells may be more, more comfortable in a compressive stress state. Great. Do um, you have an answer? Great question. Uh, uh, it's not true, Jimmy, that uh, you learn more from me than I learn you uh, from you. It's just that kind of skill that you have, I cannot learn. It's so difficult for me to learn. Like the way that you talk, the way that you motivate people, right? I, I, I always told my students that that's not something that I can learn from, 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 from my advisor. I, I also cannot, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a great fun to work with you over the years and uh, we keep very uh, close uh, contact for all yeah. the things that we do. So I- Sit I, up I, straight, <laughs> So So I, for, to your question, I, I believe that uh, the stress level that they'll perform is cell type specific, depends on what kind of cells that, that, that you, um, you're talking about. If you talk about neuron cells, uh, it performs very light stress state. If you talk about muscle, uh, muscle cells, 
uh, uh, is performed very tense uh, stress state, right? right? Yes, uh, it's, it's a uh, cell time specific. And if you do exercise, right? You will change, you probably change the stress state, right? So if, uh, for instance, uh, a person uh, uh, do uh, a, a, a sport person, a sportsman that do a lot of exercise and their muscle scale, the stress level will be very different from a normal uh, non-sportman, right? So I, I guess this, is a, this makes things very interesting and uh, very diverse. We want a diverse world, otherwise it's boring, right? <laughs> Okay, so let me push that question a little bit further, maybe following Tian's question. Tian asked about uh, malnutrition cells. Let me push it further to a question somebody asked. Uh, when you have a, a change of cell from let's say normal cell to diseased cells or from normal cell to cancer cells, do you see that setting or that set point change? Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, in my talk, I show you that for the cell, for the same cell type, you just change the uh, uh, phenotype from the uh, benign cell to the uh, malign uh, malignant cell or benign cell to the metastatic cell, the cell stress level changes. Uh, for benign cells, the stress level is higher than the uh, metastatic cells, okay? So that's why I say that you need to stay stressed, right? In that case, you need to stay stressed. No, metastatic cell is not, is not a good thing for you, right? So, uh, and that, 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 the, the stress level of that metastatic cell is very low, and that makes it easier for the nanoparticles to enter because it's softer, right? you pay less mechanical energy for the nanoparticle to enter. Yes, absolutely. When, chain, when the cell changes the phenotype, it changes the stress, stress level. Yeah, that that's makes the connection between the stress level to the disease state. So if you stretch a tumor to make it more uh, higher stress, does it cure the cancer? Very good question. It's not. It's not. Actually, there is a paper published in 2015 uh, in Nature. They exactly did that. They stretched the normal cell. I don't know, it's a fibroblast or the epithelial, I think it's an epithelial cell, normal cell. They found they, the cell become uh, 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 malignant, feeling malignant, just by, 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 by stretching the cell, normal cell, healthy cells. So by changing the stress level, it goes from benign to malignant uh, phenotype. So yes, stress uh, play a very important role in uh, governing this uh, uh, phenotype of the disease. Interesting, send me the a copy of that paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Suli. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the paper that blocks our uh, findings to the, uh, to the nature of uh, physics. Yeah. Because they thank already have that kind of phenomenon. You will, you kind of, you will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy, uh, for your questions. And also, I'm in full agreement with uh, Sulin that, uh, Jimmy, you are too humble. I'm always amazed at uh, how uh, effectively and uh, gracefully you can uh, handle and deal with the stress and the, or the stressed situations. Not only that, uh, but also that uh, for people who talk to you, try to seek help from you that ease their stress level. And uh, there is a lot we can learn from you in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Jia Qi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jia Qi Wang. Um, I'm a postdoc in Westlake University, and I'm working with Dr. Wenbin Li right now. So actually, I have two questions about the coarse grained uh, molecular dynamics. The first one is um, in the coarse grained uh, molecular dynamics, I saw the visco uh, shape transformation. So what are the dominant mechanisms for the, uh, this kind of shape transformation? Is there any specific force or specific deed in your coarse grained model that induce this kind of transformation? And uh, my second question is, uh, 
about the diffusion. So you manipulate the parameters of the interaction potential. So, um, so is this diffusion the self-diffusion and are you also interested in calculating the self-diffusivity? Uh, yeah, uh, let me, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, modeler and uh, working under a PhD, former PhD student uh, from Julie. So, um, so uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the question that you ask, uh, actually, uh, the first question, yeah, I, I probably didn't make it clear about this phase trans, uh, this uh, shape transformations of vesicles. So actually we apply the osmotic pressure uh, to the vesicles to make this happen. We apply different levels of uh, osmotic pressure, right? That is essentially what happened in vivo, okay? Uh, yeah, for the diffusion, yes. Uh, yes, we, we just, uh, uh, Manipulate the interaction potentials to uh, enable this uh, interdiffusion of the lipids uh, mm -hmm. on the cell membrane. Yes, I also uh, interested in diffusion of a single cell. If you consider single cell as a building block of our tissues and organs, just like uh, atoms, uh, a building block uh, as our crystal material, right? And that kind of work. We're trying to do that, but the uh, the building block of uh, the cell, you know, is constantly changed shape, right? So it makes things very difficult, right? I I was trying yeah. to our group were trying to use a, a phase field model to do this collective oh. migration of cells, just to consider cells, uh, each cell as 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 a building block as as a, a atmosphere simulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're working um, toward that. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know that you also need kind of mobility or diffusivity in your fuse field modeling, right? So of course, where did of you course. get this kind of mobility parameters? Of course you do uh, from the experiments, right? That's usually oh, okay. what you do, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks Jiaxi for your questions. And next, uh, Hong Yan. Uh, Hi, um, everybody. Um, Suling, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I mean, this is a great talk. And uh, uh, I, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I, I'm a former PhD student of Suling. Now I'm an associate professor at the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen. Um, uh, so what, what I want to say is, uh, um, I think I, I learned a lot, not only the biomechanics and uh, thermodynamics and these from, from Suling, um, but also now, now I realize I learned a lot about how to, you know, um, uh, lead a research group, how to advise students. And uh, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, one more thing I want to say is uh, um, the cell mechanics uh you know mechanics of living cells are are such a complex uh, subject very complicated um and so in, um um still have this courage and uh, uh, enthusiasm you know to to do it and uh, uh and i myself also um be encouraged by that and i think you know i can study cell mechanics such a you know complicated subject then I can study anything else. So, so I started uh, some new research directions. And uh, so today, you know, um, hearing about the, the long journey, like uh, starting from uh, 2008, where I, I joined the group and uh, started working on the West Coast. And uh, now I see, um, you know, Dr. Zhang um, have, you know, um, made um, a great progress in the, you know, uh, along this journey, and uh, I, I would say that uh, um, is 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 um is very uh, impressive. And uh, I, I do have a, a specific uh, um, uh, technique question. Um, so the the last uh, um, projects, the wood healing projects um, that that are going to be published in PNS, uh, when the when the hole uh, the wood is very big. Uh, it will not close as you demonstrated in the experiments. Um, is that because the, so I, I didn't get the, the exact idea, like, you know, why 
when it's very big, it does not close. Um, can you explain a little bit more? So Hongye is, uh, is my first PhD student, uh, absolutely uh, talented. And uh, he spent three years with me, and that's it. He's got a PhD and published a, lot, a whole lot of papers and later on become a postdoc in uh, uh, audience group. Audience usually don't accept many uh, postdocs, right? So uh, I feel that uh, Hong Yan, uh, from a sort of mechanics uh, training, is better than me. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, um, so to answer your question, and this, uh, th this is really how, how it close because say, in the front, you have the acting cable to pull the cell inward to bridge the gap, right? If the acting cable is small, so kappa, the, the curvature is large. So kappa gamma become larger, the track contraction is larger, right? So the smaller, so the general idea is the smaller the gap, uh, the larger the curvature, the larger the contracting force, the more powerful the uh, acting cable to pull the uh, mm. cell over. Now we also found that in this, in this study, we also found that not, in, sorry, not only doing that, but also has uh, developed a new mechanism to update this acting ring or acting cable, okay? Uh, when they are updating uh, the acting ring or acting cable, uh, the updating process actually shrinks the acting cable, so increasing the curvature, so that is a bit more powerful to close the gap. So that's a mechanism that uh, uh, nobody have uh, reported before. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Hong Yang, for your remarks and also for your question. Uh, next, Chun Jiang. Hello, Su Ning. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Chen Jiang Yu, uh, associate professor at the University of Houston uh, in Department of Mechanical Engineering. So uh, Su Ning, thanks uh, very much for delivering this uh, wonderful talk. It's uh, very, very informative. And also uh, thanks everyone for the very inspiring uh, discussions, panels, uh, questions, and also the answers. So I really learned a lot. So I actually have a question for Su Ning. Uh, so you should uh, the uh, endocyte, a cytosis of the nanoparticles, nanowires, or the rods, and they use the uh, very beautiful energy scape to predict the high, how the uh, endo, endocytosis uh, process happens. So it is very nice. So can you comment, uh, you know, for some of the objects like nano objects, they are deformable, very different, have very different mechanical property like the nanoparticle or nano nanowires that could be deformable during the uh, endocytosis uh, process. Yeah, actually I, I sort of answered the question a little bit uh, in the previous questions. Uh, so if you have a soft nanoparticle and then when the membrane wrap around this uh, soft nanoparticle, then you have an energy partition uh, 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 deformation energy partition to both the soft nanoparticle and the cell membrane. So that's a different scenario, okay? We worked on that a little bit on the, uh, uh, on the experiment side. We developed some uh, soft uh, nanoparticle using hydrogel. I once asked uh, 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 Jigang, uh, uh, say uh, if Jigang can uh, generate some uh, soft gels, <laughs> that we can use, right? Later on, we did that by ourselves, right? Uh, yes, uh, uh, it will have a different energy landscape. Uh, you have a partition of uh, the deformation energy to both parties, and that will change the uh, endocytosis, right? Thank you. So I actually, can I have another question? Go ahead. Sure, uh, so my second question is regarding the seal migration during the own healing. So, uh, as biology has been studied, that many cells, their actually a migration is significantly impacted by either the endogenous or the uh, external applied uh, electrical field. So, have you ever considered to include such a uh, or those electrical fields into the migration process for like a uh, own gap closure? Uh, let's say not yet, not yet. Uh, as I said, that cell communicate. Uh, using multilingual languages, right? Uh, communicated with different languages, yes. 
electrical signal is sometimes something that cell also respond and, uh, and, uh, and react. Yes, uh, so people also uh, consider light, you know, uh, light signals, and cell can recognize comprehend these signals as well. Uh, introducing the electrical signal is, of course, uh, 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 very important, a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, subject. We haven't uh, done that in our group. I think other groups start doing that. Uh, I mean, what, what, have we done that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sun Yang, for your questions. Uh, next, Ji Gang. Hey, Ji Gang Su from Harvard. I, uh, Sort of fantastic talk. Really, really happy to to see you blossom in in this uh, spectacular way. All right. So uh, as you talk, uh, you, you know, uh, I haven't really looked at uh, these problems myself. Um, uh, so, but I try to relate what you're talking to uh, to things I know about. Uh, so I'll ask my question towards the end. But, but uh, let me. Uh, tell you my thinking process. So I was saying, okay, um, yeah, lots of details, interesting by themselves. Su Lin is a great scientist who just want to understand things. But, uh, uh, but there might, must be some end uh, to that game. So for example, I, I think about uh, in materials, uh, we all know in last century, uh, material science and mechanics uh, made a spectacular progress by understanding why materials are brittle and weak, right? By having a lot of uh, little cracks or by moving dislocations by themselves, they're interesting, but uh, don't make difference to people's life. And then at some point in 1960s, 50s, people think, oh, we can use, make a very strong fiber uh, because then fiber is, uh, has very little crack we don't even glass fiber and put in plastic matrix. Plastic was just available in last century. Suddenly you have a very tough material. Now we use this very brittle material glass and uh, plastic, which is very soft, uh, and make aerospace material, right? You can have many, many such uh, examples. Point, you can point to major success advance in material development, mechanics development, through detailed understanding of uh, small things, little crack, little dislocation. Now, so I know it's unfair to say, point out something in your work will lead to spectacular uh, you know, development. It's too early, you're still in the middle of it. But molecular, uh, molecular mechanobiology has been a, a while, right? There must be some important success you can point to. Uh, can you give us one or two, maybe just one example that through you know, clear understanding of uh, mechanics, the role of mechanics at a cellular level actually lead to something big that normal people can appreciate. So next time I explain to my students, oh, we need to work on this because X, what is that X? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's a very tough question. Um, Not necessarily from your own work because you have been in the field yeah, uh, a long time, right? <clears throat> yeah, I know that a lot of people work in this area uh, very few of them are from mechanics community. So uh -huh. your colleagues in Dan Yingaber, uh, 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 David Morley, and a uh, group of people in Penn and in Johns Hopkins, and mechanical biology is really uh, originated, uh, maybe I'm wrong, uh, from a bunch of people from Columbia University, uh, 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 Xu Chen, right? So the microscopic Biomechanics, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, applications uh, did, uh, uh, like a pacemaker, yeah. like uh, heart pumps. Molecular level, I don't know, okay? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, people are trying to make a case, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, people uh, think that uh, mechanical 
targeting in different area. Okay, we can target in my in my work is the using uh, nanoparticles to target different type of cells with different mechanical problems. And uh, uh, mechanical targeting or mechano mechanotherapy is something that people start to raise. Uh, people start to raise uh, uh, some uh, applications uh, from these groups. Okay, but I don't know uh, exactly uh, what kind of products uh, uh, have have been done. Uh, probably due to my ignorance or my, uh, my, 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 my lack of knowledge in this area. Right? Maybe time uh, is still too, too short. Or uh, do you know, uh, so what is the uh, time scale we're talking about? Well, when did this uh, molecular cellular mechanobiology people begin to think do you know, scientific study? That might, might be very recent. Uh, how, how recent is this? I think I think uh, uh, it's not very long. The kind of biology, the, the, the time period is not very long, and that's probably one of the reason that yeah. we see we, we at least we don't know for sure or uh, clear the, the product there or the application there. Uh, so, for yeah, example, I, what is a milestone a discovery you can point to that seemed to be very interesting? Unusual, not application yet. Something like a crack dislocation. No application in the beginning, right? It's just something that happened, a little thing happened. But it's a, you, you can sense this is important. In the field, do you guys have a wonderful uh, session? So, yeah. uh, so down, may, may yeah. I? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe Dennis Deacher's work on the uh, matrix stiffness. Uh, uh, dependent uh, stem cell differentiation. How about that work? Okay. Oh, oh, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's the uh, Hongyan. Thank you. That's uh, a fantastic work. If you go to uh, Daniel Fisher's paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, wrote, he, he wrote this paper in 2004, 2005. Was uh, cited like a uh, ten thousand times. That's people know. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's about the stem cell technology. Right. Just uh, to uh, put the yeah. cells on the substrate with different stiffness. And the, the stem cell can differentiate into different kind of cell types. Yeah. Uh, that's one way to look at it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Hong Yan. Uh, uh, I, I certainly I am familiar with this work. I talked yeah. with uh, Dan Zischer <laughs> uh, quite you. a few times. Yeah. Uh, about, about, about I, I know you are you are tired. You are tired. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's 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 a great example. That yes, yes. Sorry for that. Yeah, that's that's a great work, and every cited. And that's probably uh, one of the most important important products or techniques that we use to direct the differentiation of the cells to the right the right direction, right? We control that. We control that. Yeah. So, Jika uh, Sunli, can I add on a little bit? I uh, so in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, where people do acupuncture, that uh, you 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 uh, poke. The, you stimulate your neurons with the sharp needle. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether that's, that can be considered as uh, one application of uh, uh, mechanobiology. Uh, but in, in that, I'm not, not sure whether people really study uh, that phenomenon at the cellular level or molecular level. Uh, but I think in, in cancer research field, uh, one of the uh, research area people are trying to focus on is uh, called mechanomedicine. Uh, where people try to target uh, the, try to change the acrocellular uh, matrix uh, property uh, using medicine uh, yeah. to manipulate uh, cancer cell behavior. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely challenging. Uh, it's, it's something people are, are, are looking into. Yeah, the, the people are trying, thank you, Changjin, and that's uh, this uh, Chinese puncture, uh, puncture is, is, is a great example that but we have never studied this uh, uh, on the uh, molecular level. Uh, yes, a lot of things are on the way. Yeah, you change the environment, you change the stimuli, you change the cell functions, you change cell behaviors. You uh, you also uh, are using this uh, mechanical ways to detect, uh, uh, diagnose, uh, diagnose uh, cancer, etc. Well, a lot of things are on the way. Uh, I'm not sure that if uh, it's uh, FDA approved, right? Uh, for instance, for nanoparticles, right? 
uh, there are uh, several types of uh, mm -hmm. FDA uh, approved nanoparticles. Uh, I, I don't know what the, what the efficiency of these nanoparticles in for chemo, uh, chemo, uh, 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 chemotherapy. But I would argue that if you add in this uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical therapy, uh, mechanical targeting probably it works better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for all these great <laughs> answers. I'm very happy. <laughs> Chigong, Chigong. <laughs> Just in case you didn't notice, both yeah. Hong Yan and Chang Jin were Sulin students. So when yeah. your advisor is in trouble, the students come to rescue you. <laughs> <laughs> Never in trouble. So, yeah, my uh, Chang Jin and, uh, and Hong Yan are great, uh, my great students, my favorite students. And really, really, they um, did a fantastic job with me. And, uh, yeah. and I, I have a lot of fun work with them. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I hope Jimmy feels the same way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jigan, for the top. And the speaker uh, blame that he's our own advisor, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jigan, for the top but the uh, thought provoking question. Uh, next, Chang Yong. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Chang Yong Tao uh, from Michigan State University. Uh, I'm working as an assistant professor here. Uh, thank you, uh, Su Lin and uh, the panelists uh, for the discussions. Uh, Su Lin is a great talk, a wonderful and uh, very inspiring and uh, knowledgeable. Uh, so uh, 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 I, let me ask a uh, short question. So uh, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, you, you are talking about the fear of migration and the wood aliens. And uh, so uh, you discussed uh, the uh, the shapes of the whole, uh, uh, the circular shape or the elliptic uh, shape. Uh, I'm wondering if the uh, the sphere, uh, the whole size, uh, is a smaller one uh, and the larger one. You know, which which one will will be here uh, quickly? And uh, in particular, I think uh, uh, also mentioned before, uh, it's a similar like the curvature problem and. Uh, for the internal surface, internal edge, and the outer, outer edge, uh, it, it's like you, you have a circular plate, the stair sheet, and then internal, you, you dig a hole, and then outside the surface uh, and the internal the surface, so which one will, the stairs will spread a faster stair. Uh, it's a curiosity. So, so yeah, we patent the cell in that, uh, in that, in that, in that domain. So the outer layer, the outer, uh, uh, all the outer, outer, uh, outer realm or all the, the outer prefer periphery of the cell colony is kind of fixed. Okay. So outside this domain, you don't have adhesives and cell will not expand further. Okay. Now we leave a hole, we leave a, a gap in between and in, inside and uh, trying to observe how cell invade this gap. Yeah, so uh, uh, if you make the uh, whole domain large enough, this, uh, this out boundary will not, will not uh, affect the behavior of the uh, gap, clo gap closure. So that's what uh, we did, we, 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 we checked in our experiment. We make sure that the, you know, you have a boundary effect, right? If the boundary is, uh, is far, far away enough, then the boundary effect just, uh, 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 you know, disappear. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, uh, before, uh, a few years ago, actually, uh, we, we did some experience and uh, it's, uh, it's not the, uh, it's like a digger hole. We're just using the um, a blader, you know, to cut uh, uh, a completely separated two pieces. And then to see if the how fast they can go, it, it seems the the stairs still you know uh, touching together, trying to move uh, toward each other, and uh, uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, didn't see, uh, don't know actually we didn't know which uh, how it will affect their behaviors. Uh, that's uh, that's called the scratching uh, scratching acid. So in that case, uh, the the hole or the, the gap is actually adhesive. So uh, so it will walk into the adhesive bed. So that will give you different mechanism that we are talking about here. Actually, I illustrate two uh, uh, classical mechanisms for gap closure. So you'll talk about this uh, 
cell crawling or cell migration mechanisms. Right? Okay. So okay. In, in vivo, in vivo, in, in, in vivo, uh, cell care will meet a given kinds of gaps, adhesive, non-adhesive. So here we, 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 our study is focused on the, uh, focused on the non-adhesive gaps. That means cell cannot, uh, cannot adhere. Uh, adherence to substrate, you have still have to build a bridge uh, over to close the gap. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Thank you, Chang, for your question. Next, uh, Ping Chang. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Ping Chang from Nanyang Technological University. And I thank Prof. Zhang for the uh, source talk. And I noticed that in your talk, you use the term force a lot. So I have a question out of curiosity, might be uh, naive. So could there be any like specificity of the cell responses to different stresses like the shear stress, tensile stress, and compressive stress, plus their spatial temporal uh, variation so, so in such a way that is similar to the antigen and antibody recognition? So of course, uh, Ping Chang actually, uh, we are collaborating uh, with, uh, uh, we're collaborating on a a uh, small gap closure is even smaller on the, on the subcellular level. Uh, Ping Zhang is doing a fantastic job there uh, in collaboration with Jenny and uh, Xiao Deng Chen in uh, Nanyang Technological uh, University. So uh, Ping Zhang is uh, writing a masterpiece, <laughs> <laughs> trying to uh, submit to nature. Uh, no, where yes. is it? Uh, and the current, uh, yeah. So, uh, but, but there's actually a, a wonderful job uh, there. I can say the, 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 the great hope. <laughs> So get back to your question. Uh, yes, uh, different cells respond to different kind of uh, uh, forces. For instance, uh, red blood cell would, would respond to the shear force, right? The shear flow, right? Uh, the muscle cells would respond uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, contraction, okay? Contraction. So this, is, of course, is a cell type specific, cell, cell type dependent. Right, uh, very diverse, and when when you when you when you apply these forces to the uh, to the cells, and yes, cell will express. Uh, you you will change gene expression, right? change gene expression. Uh, uh, that's something that we are uh, working on with a bunch of people in uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, with uh, Shang Sun, with uh, Karen Reddy. It's a great uh, uh, mechanical biologist and. Uh, and uh, biologist. So what we're trying to, to say is, if we apply cell forces to cell, how would we change the gene expression? Mm -hmm. right? So that so, so there is a, a whole lot of the uh, biochemical signaling pathways interact with the mechanical uh, transmission pathways. Okay. So you have you give cell a mechanical stimuli, cell will comprehend this stimuli and convert it to the biochemical sing uh, signal. And then uh, this signal will transmit it all the way to the nucleus and change the gene expression. And we are changing the gene, gene expression, it change the expression of proteins, it change the phenotype of cells. So we're trying to work out a, 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 a this sequence, okay? This whole information passing uh, pathways is, is we start work on this like uh, three years ago, <laughs> right? So uh, no concrete results so far. I, I think John Hopkins people uh, kind of ready did a great job uh, on the imaging. Uh, Sean Sen did a great job on uh, develop this uh, apparatus to stress cells with tiny forces. Yeah, uh, my work is uh, simulating this process. It's uh, fascinating. Yeah, and uh, 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 connecting mechanical forces to uh, 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 mechanical epigenetics. So if we like narrow down the question, if like we say for the cellular skeleton, would they have different like preference towards the shear stress, compressive stress, and tensile stress? Like any specificity, uh, specific responses to uh, uh, forces of different uh, resources. Is, is it possible to pre predict that in some uh, mechanical viewpoint? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you can. So, so all this simulation or uh, experiment, uh, when we do this experiment simulations, has to be uh, cell type specific. 
It's just like a way to handle simulation, we have to choose the reference configuration. Okay. So for any cell type, the reference configuration will be different. The preferred stress level will be different. I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, I think that inspired me a lot. And also like the support you offered in the collaboration and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really great to work with you. Thank you, Ping Xiang. Uh, the question next, uh, Teng Zhang. Hi, everyone. This is Teng Zhang. I'm from Syracuse University. And thanks to Su Lin for the very nice talk. I learned a lot. And I want to ask uh, two related questions in the tissue level. And we know that um, many of our tissue organs are, are gradient material, like the skin, we have multi-layer, and also bone and the cartilage. So I, I suspect that uh, this gradient structure is also some like a response of the stress at the tissue and organ level. So my first question is, uh, how, how, how can we connect the like a stress response at the cell level and, uh, and couple with the like a environment or eventually lead to like a gradient, like a tissue organ. And um, a related question is now some people in the like engineering field and trying to use this mechanics to train engineering material. Like a professor Jian Pinggong and the professor Xuan He Zhao did some very nice work. They make some hydrogel, then they train, use like a cyclone loading to train the engineering material to improve the mechanical property. So the following question is, uh, now if you understand that it's a, a cell response, is it possible you design some artificial cell and embedded this artificial cell in the like uh, engineering material, then they can respond to the mechanical stimuli to achieve adaptive and um, optimized property? Uh, great, great, great questions, Tim. Uh, that's actually what we are trying to do here. So to your first question, how will you scale up from a single cell to the uh, tissue and, uh, and organ level? Yes, uh, this is uh, from the simulation point of, view, point of view, you need to scale up by doing multi-scale, so-called multi-scale uh, modeling, right? So basically, you need to uh, impart this cell-cell uh, communication uh, or cell substrate uh, communication into your system, okay, to scale up. So basically, you need to consider the collective behavior of the cells uh, to scale up, and that's actually exactly what we are doing here, okay. Uh, that makes the all kind of communication scales or, or uh, methods that cell uh, implement very important. The second question is that. Uh, how do you, is that possible to put cells in uh, uh, synthetic materials to improve the, uh, the, the, the properties of the synthetic materials, uh, making use of the, uh, the wonderful, fascinating material properties of cells? This is actually exactly what we are trying to do here now uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, a group of people in chemistry, like Lauren Zaza. Uh, so uh, in that group, they can put a pro this uh, motor proteins into the hydrogels and to contract the hydrogel, okay? Uh, just to give you one example. Uh, the protein, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, motor proteins is really the power of the power source of the cell, right? And then we start to mix with, uh, and, and we, we start to uh, propose to mix uh, this, uh, this, 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 uh, 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 they uh, live, uh, uh, living uh, cells with some non-living cells together, right? And uh, we start to exploit the interactions of this living cells and non-living cells. Uh, I'm not the guy doing the experiment, but this is certainly very interesting. Uh, I think MIT has a group trying to understand this kind of thing, I think also it's called, I think it's a center uh, effort. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. So that's a great question. That's something that I'm working toward, whether we can change the uh, material properties using the living materials, right? Make it is active, responsive. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the question. And next is Lei. Hello. Yeah, my name is Lei Chen. Currently, I am assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. 
Actually, I was a postdoc doctor under Dr. Long Ching Chen's group. So in that case, I had a lot of communications with Dr. Zhang as well. Dr. Zhang provided a lot of advice to me. Yeah, we, we even had a, a number of meetings just in, the, in this year. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, here uh, I have one question regarding the phase field model. You talked about the phase field modeling for your problem. Yeah, as we know, for the phase field model, normally we have the, you also talking about the, you know, thermodynamic energy. For the phase field model, normally we, we have to formulate, for example, the uh, the chemical energy, uh, you know, even electrical energy, uh, also the mechanical energy. You, but for, for your problem, uh, for the mechanical energy, even the mechanic force is quite, is, is, is tiny, right? It's, it's not easy to, to merge. Uh, okay, and then another, I think, in my opinion, it's more challenging for us to even formulate the uh, electro, uh, for example, electro energy. So, for example, for metal, we have the K, KKS model to formulate the chemical energy. So, here my question is like, uh, uh, Dr. John, uh, do you know, for example, there are some experimental uh, measurement information or results which can be used to inspire or even can be guides to construct the chemical energy in the, for example, in the phase field model? Uh, we, we just, uh, uh, that's a great question that, uh, uh, by the way, when I talked to Long Qing, they said, all the system, uh, you can use so many angles to study that. <laughs> that I learned a lot from him. So uh, no, no particular uh, uh, guidance I just treat this uh, system as a, as a general solution, uh, uh, you know, general solution uh, 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 model, right, to, to construct the chemical energy as we do from uh, typical, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, solid materials. Uh, it's a solution, right, it's a solution. So uh, this uh, ideal solution model or non-ideal solution model from thermodynamics works, I think, quite well. Uh, the question is that how would they get this, uh, these numbers? Yeah, that requires experiments. And we strive to collaborate with the biologists to get these uh, parameters in our simulations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But maybe it's the it's a very long process. It's not it's not easy, it's challenging, yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, so these parameters is always very difficult to get. And sometimes you have to make make the up and say if your results are matches with experimental results. And that's one way to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Hui Yang. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Hui Yang from Huanzhou University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm also from Sunin's group. Sunin was my PhD advisor. I spent almost uh, more than five years in Sunin's group. And then a lot of uh, a lot of more sense from him, not only uh, the research scale, but also the um, how to deal with uh, uh, students and how to uh, leading a research group like that. So I really learn a lot. Of. So uh, I really want to thanks my advisor Suni, uh, because. Uh, my research background is uh, uh, electro, uh, chemical, and mechanical coupling problem. Uh, 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 problem. So, uh, and currently, I'm mean doing uh, the coupling effect in energy related material, like, such like battery material or electro chemical uh, catalyst. So, my question is is it possible for uh, for us to develop a um, uh, real multi-physical coupling uh, model to simulate the uh, cell in real system, because the cell uh, in real system is always under different uh, different uh, external st st uh, stimuli, such oh. as uh, um, stress 
express a uh, electric singular or magnetic field like that. So uh, is it possible to give them a model to deal, deal with more of the uh, uh, driving force? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, you know that uh, uh, a lot of people uh, actually usually I give talks on electric chemistry coupled with mechanics. So I don't give a lot of talks on the biology. Um, to me that these two systems are very similar. Uh, uh, it's messy, right? It's messy. It's very challenging. You have to, have to know uh, electric, uh, chemistry, uh, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of electric, electrical. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a metaphysical uh, problem. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, actually, I learned a lot uh, from the research that we do together uh, from mechanics uh, in electrochemistry. So we, uh, so I, I actually um, uh, borrow a lot of concepts from the electrochemistry to biochemistry. Okay, so that's why I think that. I, I can do both, uh, a little bit of both, uh, because there's no much difference to me, okay? Uh, you have a, a, a highly irreversible process uh, going on for both processes, right? You have diffusion, you have temperature, uh, you, ha you have a some of a conduction, you, you, you have, yeah, you have all, you have mechanical processes there, right? They're really similar. So if you can do that in electric chemistry, you can also do that in biochemistry. It's just a matter of, what kind of length scale uh, uh, you, you, you want to do? What kind of time scale you want to cover, right? So, so yes, uh, we're working toward that, you know, in a similar way that we do uh, on uh, electrochemistry. Yeah, Hui is uh, really fantastic at working on this electrochemical stuff. So, um, um, worked out a lot of interesting problems. I feel like that if I talk about electrochemistry, uh, uh, it's like a, a probably not, it's probably, a, no, yeah, it's probably a very interesting as well. No. Thanks, Dora. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Uh, next, uh, Yao Zhang. Hello, everyone. I'm Yao Zhang. I'm the former PhD student of Su Lin, and currently I'm a postdoc at the Center for Diglo Cellulose Formation and Structure at the Penn State University. And uh, it's a r really amazing to view our long journey in biomechanics. And uh, I, I stayed in Sunin's group for more than five years. And uh, at the first uh, two years, I was only working on modeling. And from third year, begin, I began to work on the cell mechanics experiments. And uh, I don't have any uh, background about experiments, about cell, and we start this uh, experiments in our collaborations lab in the, in the biomedical department. It's really amazing. And I think I really appreciate, appreciate those on keep motiv uh, motivate us to working on the new area. And also I learned a lot from him, both from the modeling and also the research vision. And I have a question is that, you know that we are from the mechanical community and we are more focused on the role of uh, of mechanics and also it's a science related. If you are from the biomedical engineering, you are more focused on the translational science and uh, the struggle for us that we we focus on the mechanics, the role of mechanics. Sometimes it's uh, difficult to get the funding from NIH. If you are the, from the biomedical um, um, community, it's, much easier to get a funding because we targeting different problem. My question is that if we are from the mechanic community, what kind of topic, research topic should we to work on? What's the balance between this uh, science and, and also the translational studies? Yeah, uh, Yao, uh, so I, I think I owe Yao uh, something. So Yao was the uh, first author uh, for these two peanut papers on malaria, um, and also co-authored the, the another uh, peanut paper that they just uh, get accepted. He's now uh, working with the Dan Cross Group uh, uh, and also with me on the plant cell wall. So we just sent out a paper to science. It's uh, getting reviewed. Uh, I didn't send out the reviews, so that's a good sign. 
So uh, that uh, so y'all did that uh, uh, this metastatic paper. Uh, this was uh, it was sent out to Nature Physics for review. We did for two years. I, I think that if that paper get accepted, and uh, then the situation will be a little different for y'all, right? <laughs> but I think that y'all is doing a fantastic job, uh, both on the uh, modeling side and the, and the, and the experimental side. So y'all, you're, you're asking a very tough question that I'm facing, right? So I, I was always ask my question, uh, ask the same question that, uh, that you asked. Uh, should I chase the money? Not chase the money, right? Uh, or you, you work on something that you're interested. I think that's, that's a very tough uh, decision that only Jigan can find that. Uh, Jigan actually uh, made this balance. Maybe Jigan doesn't need to, uh, to find, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, I, I think that uh, uh, the best way to do that is through collaboration. So you still keep the core interest of your research and then you collaborate with your uh, with with this uh, uh, with these people doing translational research, and uh, uh, by then so I think that uh, 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 start working. I think in my in my experience, for instance, I'm working with uh, you know uh, Dan. You know uh, he can bring a lot of uh, uh, resources from DOE. I uh, working with uh, people from biomedical engineering like Jin Yang. Uh, he's uh, uh, working on this uh, very translational research on nerve regeneration and uh, wood healing. Uh, yeah, by doing so, you keep yourself in the realm of, of, your, of your interest while extend uh, to the other research field. And uh, yeah, because this, uh, com this complementary uh, uh, expertise, you can get funding while you can do things that you want, uh, you, you're interested. I think that's just one way that I'm trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, y'all, for your question. And uh, it's getting uh, pretty late for, especially for our friend in Asia. So you started from uh, late night of November 11th. Now it's already November 12th, uh, 1.21 uh, a.m. in the morning. So let's uh, uh, wrap up here and thank uh, suiting for such a wonderful uh, talk and um, the uh, uh, inspiring and the stimulating discussions with all the panel uh, list here as well. Um, I guess the EML webinar is such a unique place where you see, for example, today uh, the three generations of uh, uh, Jim Xia family, academic family, uh, getting a virtual reunion here and uh, uh, not quite often you see something like this. And uh, I guess the take home message Suling give us is, um, we probably need to embrace the stress, but don't get too much stress. And, uh, and uh, if uh, you need a remedy or need a rescue, come to EML webinar. This is the right place to get the right amount of stress, not too much, not too little, uh, just about right. So I uh, hope to see everyone uh, next week. Thank you, Suling. Yeah, thanks, Ken. I want to mention that Wen, Wen Peng uh, is here. Uh, he's our uh, exam brother. You know, uh, I didn't have a chance to introduce him. Uh, yeah, uh, Wen Peng, thank you for coming by. It's pretty late there. Thank you all for joining us for this uh, webinar. We'll continue on this. And the Gan did a fantastic job for leading this up. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, Jigan, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sulin, thank, thank you. Sulin, yeah. nice thank to see you here. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. talk, Sulin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. yeah. Next week. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye, guys. Have a good sleep. Yanfei. <laughs> thank you, Sulin. Yeah, thanks. Catch up with you later. Yeah. Uh, sure. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.